Yes, finally part 14. You're welcome now. Let's begin. This has really helped me to disconnect. The brown-haired commented, as he rode his motorcycle back to Kuo, carrying Penemu on his back. I think it's been a great day, and I really feel great to continue my training. Issei continued, outlining a small smile. Although, I still think that I would have liked to have stayed longer, together. It's been quite nice being on the beach with you. He finished the brown hair, being slightly surprised when he felt how Penemu hugged him around the waist and joined his body with hers. Do you want to know how I have felt? Or rather, how do I feel? The cadre asked, receiving a quick nod from the chestnut. I feel very strong beats under my skin. And it's my heart, which is beating so strongly, because you make me feel, Penemu would position her chin on the brunette's shoulder. As if she was alive again. Issei couldn't help but blush slightly at her words, though that blush quickly dissipated when he looked at the face of the fallen. With her eyes closed, and that beautiful smile on her face as her long, silky hair fluttered in the wind. She seemed to be so happy and relaxed, something Issei never saw in Penemu. Perhaps, it was really making her feel alive again. And he couldn't be more than happy for the happiness of a woman he admires and loves so much. Yes, I wished more and more that that unique day could have been extended for several more days. And he wasn't the only one who thought the same. Chapter 29 the other bishop. Issei and Penemu entered the old academy building, to see how Tiamat seemed to be looking through Issei's photo album with a lot of energy, sitting on top of the main desk. Hello. Issei greeted quickly, at the same time that Penemu raised her hand with little energy, making her typical greeting. Tiamat lowered the album from her face, causing both Penemu and Issei to be shocked by the great vigor and cute smile that the dragon gave off. Welcome back. The dragon exclaimed with great happiness. What did you do this last day? Penemu asked, unable to help but raise an eyebrow. You look, reinvigorated, about what we talked about the other day. Tiamat obliviously ignored Penemu's question, making the fallen's eyebrow rise even higher. He is in the last room of the institution. He has various seals, but I already took care of destroying them. Only the padlocks are missing. She explained the dragon, causing Issei to look at her in great surprise. Wait. Are you telling me that they're locking up a person in the corridor that they forbade me to go through? The chestnut asked, impressed by the information. It's not a person, it's a demon. Tiamat made it clear his disgust towards the species. But, it's kind of strange, the dragon commented, lowering her gaze slightly. What weirdness are we talking about, exactly? Penemu asked, crossing her arms. Well, for starters, her demonic aura isn't the same as the others, Tiamat looked up looking very seriously at the two. In fact, it's not only very different, but it's also almost non-existent. As if it's broken, to say the least. That explains why you couldn't feel his presence all this time, Penemu explained, rubbing her chin. Does that mean what is potentially dangerous? Asked the chestnut. That would explain the reason for his confinement. I don't think so. Tiamat commented, staring at him. Just because his aura is different, I didn't feel any kind of hostility, or malice prominent from him. A look with a hint of understanding appeared on the dragon's face. In fact, I just felt that he was afraid, afraid of himself. Issei rubbed his nose at the collected information, wondering what was the reason for hiding such valuable information from him. He might be getting herself into big trouble, and he would really take the punishment if something bad happened, but he knew very well that Tiamat couldn't be getting it wrong. For that reason, if things turned out as he believed, Rias would have to give him an explanation, and a very good one, in fact. Issei finally put his annoyance aside, running towards the mysterious room. I'll be right back, she yelled at herself, leaving both women alone. Tiamat picked up the album again and continued to look at the few photos that were there, something Penemu quickly joined her in doing. I guess we're thinking the same thing. Penemu commented, outlining a rather loving smile on her face as she ran a finger over the photo of the chestnut when he was little. Issei is a child. Yes yes. Tiamat nodded several times with great joy. Issei's children will be very similar to them. The dragon exclaimed with great happiness. She hugged Penemu with great intensity. Imagine if we had. Tiamat's words trailed off as different thoughts of both women synchronized, caring for their young children and embracing the chestnut. Somehow that made the two of them a bit disappointed. 
Tiamat separated from Penemu, lowering her gaze with some pain. I'm sorry. Don't worry. She answered the Kadri, giving him a small smile. I think that everyone needs dreams to be happier, even if they can't come true. A small smile appeared on Tiamat's face after hearing what she heard, and then she looked at one of the photos. She turned the page, seeing the photo where she and Penemu appeared together with the love of her life, celebrating her birthday. Oblivious to all the talk between the two women in love, Issei arrived at the room chained, preparing to smash the locks. The chestnut couldn't help but be surprised when said chains were much more resistant than they appeared. Asterisk they are magical chains. It is a type of seal, one of the simplest and weakest. Diedreg commented through the gauntlet. Asterisk although they are the weakest, you need a great deal of power to break them. Luckily, your training has made your balance breaker's power and mastery almost perfect. It's time to put the training to the test. He finished, with some emotion in his final words. Issei activated his balance breaker, and the augments began to silently glow on his gauntlet's gem at an impressive speed, causing the brunette herself to blink in utter surprise at such a dynamic surge of power. The gem finished flickering in a few seconds, indicating that his sacred gear's mastery had also increased noticeably, making the increases much faster. Surprising, the brunette thought, clenching his fist. I feel like I'm twice as strong as the month before, even a bit more. Asterisk it's not just that. Diedreg commented quickly, making the brunette look at his gauntlet. Asterisk in your training, you doubled the amount of your magical reserves. Now, with a much higher raise cap, and control over your balance breaker, I estimate that balance breaker's time in battle increased from 8 minutes to over 20 hours, as long as you don't waste your magic, of course. That means that now I could take advantage of the extension of the battles, and it wouldn't be a negative point for me anymore, the brown-haired commented, unable to avoid smiling at what he heard. I see you understood quickly. Diedreg commented with a proud tone, before turning serious. Now, focus on opening that door, and getting ready, just in case, Issei just nodded at her tenant's warning and took it quickly. Her firm, tense posture was proof of that. Issei took the chain, and stared at the doors for a few seconds, until he finally ripped them from one second to the next, causing a gigantic blizzard to be created in the corridor, which made the windows vibrate. The brown-haired man opened the door slowly, without even making the slightest noise, seeing that everything was quite dark but thanks to his demonic vision he could witness the room. Is it a bedroom? She couldn't help but think when she saw the decorative ones. The place looked a bit gothic, which gave her a little chill, which only intensified when she heard a voice coming from nowhere. Uh, it looks like it's very windy today. Issei turned his head in various directions frantically, trying to find the source of the voice. Well, it's not something I really care about. The voice sounded somewhat gloomy and with a bit of an echo, and that itself made Issei alert. This guy is much tougher than I thought. On this occasion, the brown-haired man was able to distinguish the direction of the voice, fixing his gaze on a small box. Is it in there? She wondered internally, only to hear different buttons later. Are you playing on a console? She wondered again, thinking that such a mysterious and sinister voice doesn't suit her to play those kinds of games. Even so, the brown-haired man wasn't confident, so he slowly approached the box, to then approach his hand with the same slowness. Sweat began to pour down her face as she listened to different murmurs and buttons being pressed. Finally, Issei removed the box in one move, then instantly got into a fighting stance, waiting for any kind of attack. After a second, the brown-haired man couldn't help but make a face when he saw a blonde boy a little smaller than him wearing women's clothes. The boy's eyes quickly filled with tears, and then he gave a loud scream and threw the console at his face, causing Issei to fall to the ground after such a blow. Stay away, don't come closer. She yelled, getting to the furthest point from him, still inside the strange bedroom. Hey, calm down, she answered the brunette with slight anger, while he rubbed his red face. I'm not going to hurt you. That is not the problem. Hearing it, Issei couldn't help but take a step back. I do not want to hurt you. Hurt me. The chestnut wondered internally. Asterisk if it's a reincarnated devil, it must have a sacred gear. Probably, it can't control it. We'd better proceed with caution. The dragon commented cautiously. Asterisk also, I can sense that he is a half vampire. Diedreg added, causing Issei to widen his eyes in great disbelief. 
I understood that they had disappeared a thousand years ago, after the Great War. It was one of the few species that was exterminated by Trihexa. Or so I thought. The dragon concluded, making Issei slightly serious. I guess that's not important right now. The problem is his sacred gear, since I don't know what it can do. She answered the brunette, making the boy cover his eyes with his hands at the mention of his sacred gear. Please, go away. The boy commented, denoting that his dark voice was only due to the fact that he was inside a box. I don't want to hurt you. I can't control myself. What happened? Penemu came running. That is, Issei collided his palm with his fist. You could help us. Hearing this, Penemu couldn't help but tilt her head a little and blink in confusion, and then look at the boy, who covered his face again after catching the cadre's gaze. I see, Penemu commented, before approaching the boy. Wait, don't come. The blonde waved his hands frantically. Penemu didn't care much about his warnings, approaching him and taking his arm causing him to grit his teeth slightly when he felt how everything slowed down, besides that he felt heavier. Even so, the power that emanated from the boy was too weak for the cadre's level, so she easily crouched down and looked at him face to face, making the blonde look shocked to see that Penemu barely seemed to be affected. What is this? The brunette wondered, trying to enter the small grey capsule that had formed in the room. Do not enter! Penemu exclaimed quickly, causing the brunette to jump back. It's a kind of control in time or space, or both. It doesn't affect you, only if you're strong enough to handle it. She concluded, then looked at the child. What is your name? Penemu's serious and somber look made the blonde begin to tremble. Ga Gasper. Greedo. Gasper Vladdy. The Vladdy. I thought they were dead. Penemu wondered aloud, then gave him a death glare. You're lying to me. Gasper could feel how his entire spine trembled deeply after the cadre's gaze and aura. NN number no. The half-vampire could barely speak. I swear. Penemu brought her face closer to Gasper's, narrowing her eyes with great suspicion. The boy began to tremble at the intense gaze. Finally, Penemu's gaze softened noticeably and she released him. You are too scared. He concluded, causing Gasper to lower his head as comical tears threatened to fall from his eyes. Surely that's the reason why you can't control your power. Hearing this, Gasper couldn't help but look at her in surprise. If you can't even control your own emotions, how do you plan to control such a conflicting power? He asked her, causing the half-vampire to lower his head and slightly clench his fists. Penemu turned and started to leave. I'm not going to waste my time with a scaredy cat. This only made Gasper clench his fists tighter. As the cadre passed Issei's side, she whispered to him in one swift motion. If he learns how to direct his emotions, he will learn how to control his power. I threatened and ridiculed him to see his power fluctuate, and he is extremely unstable, not only because of his emotions, but because of the absurd amount of magic he possesses. No wonder devils to give up so quickly. The cadre fixed her gaze for a short second on Issei. But you won't give up, will you? She ended up leaving the chestnut. Where are you going? The brown-haired asked, seeing how the cadre raised her hand in greeting. Tiamat recently left because she forgot something at your house, and she seemed to be quite nervous, although she tried to hide it. She commented, before putting both her hands in her pockets and stopping at the end of the hall, to give him one last look. I'll go see if he needs any help, and then I'll do my job. You know how Grigori handles himself. She concluded her, before leaving. Finally. The brunette and Gasper looked at each other, causing the latter to cover his face with the console. I suppose this is going to be a long day, the brunette thought with great boredom. Several minutes later, Issei found that it wasn't very difficult to strike up a conversation with Gasper, as long as he kept his distance. In fact, the boy seemed quite receptive and gladly received all the talks given by the brown-haired man, something that even surprised him. Hem, sir, Gasper tried to speak. Issei. Issei Hyodo. She spoke to the brown, causing a small smile to appear on the half-vampire. Hyodo. May I know why you want to help me? She asked, lowering her head a bit. Well, haven't you been lonely all this time? The brunette asked, receiving a quick no from Gasper. I do not do it. She answered. I know that if I stay here, I won't cause trouble for others, she replied, lowering her head again. I don't want to hurt people and the president said that the only thing I could do, 
was to stay here, since something had gone wrong with my reincarnation, and they had no idea how to help me. Afterwards, I was able to listen through the door that something had gone wrong, since he hadn't changed in the slightest, and that he was still a coward. Issei couldn't help but frown at this. She told you that, she thought to herself, but quickly put the subject on the back burner. It doesn't matter what they said. Living locked up is not living. I've also been alone for a long time, and for that reason I don't recommend it to you in the slightest. But, it would be very selfish to want to be with others, while I hurt them. He commented, lowering his head again, something that began to annoy the brunette. Can you at least tell me that you tried to control the overflows of your magic, or even know what magic is? She asked herself, then rolled her eyes at Gaspar's extremely cowardly reaction. No, she screamed. Magic scares me. Magic scares you. He asked the brunette, receiving a quick nod from Gaspar. So let me show you something cool. He concluded, making Gaspar look at him intently as he stood up. Issei raised his hand, creating an orb of violet energy. This made Gaspar look at him with great intrigue. Can you use magic without conjuring it? The half vampire asked, shocked at the sight. I don't know if you noticed, but every time you used your power, you weren't even using a magic circle. Let's just say that this is something similar, although I'm not giving my sacred gear magic like you do. She explained the brunette, unable to help but look at him with a bit of envy. Honestly, I'm very envious of you. I had to learn all the principles of magic before I could use it, because my magical reserves back then were low. They aren't much a thing now though, she finished, rubbing her hair nervously at his last words. Gaspar got up and looked closely at the orb, seeing that it seemed to be completely harmless. Do you want to touch it? The brunette asked, making Gaspar look at him with great concern. But if I'm sure, don't worry, she quickly answered the chestnut. I'm the one proposing to get close to you. So if something happens to me, it will be my fault, and mine alone. Hum, if you put it like that, the blonde commented, slowly approaching Issei. His gaze seemed so focused on the orb that he didn't give much importance to the chestnut, and he didn't get nervous. His curiosity was probably at its highest right now. Apparently, they didn't even take the time to train him. This goes without saying, because he should at least know how magic works. He thought the brunette, seeing that Gaspar seemed quite hesitant. Touch it, I promise it won't hurt you. Issei commented with a smile, making Gaspar look at him uneasily. Trust me. Hearing her last words, Gaspar swallowed hard and slowly brought his trembling hand closer to the orb, then lightly touched its surface. He widened his eyes in complete shock when he didn't feel any pain at all, in fact, the texture felt like that of a slime. Gaspar put his whole hand into the orb, making a huge smile appear on his face while his eyes sparkled with great excitement. Wow! He exclaimed completely excited. How is this possible? As I said before, you have yet to learn the principles of magic. The chestnut commented, as long as you want to use magic without wanting to harm anyone, it will just be that way. It's strange to do so though, since magic is usually used for hostile purposes, or as you do in your case, defensive purposes. Seeing that Gaspar seemed very interested in the topic, Issei decided to continue. There are also different types of magic, or rather, functions for magic. Those different functions can be provided through a sacred gear, by healing factors, or by having a lineage with extraordinary powers, among others. You are just like me, because, as far as I know, we both have sacred gears, and we both have a healing factor. Though the latter is possessed by all beings who know how to use magic. Your first master? Gaspar asked, still moving his hand inside the orb. Does that mean you had more than one? I had two in total. She answered the chestnut. The first is a dragon named Tiamat, and the second is the cadre you met a few moments ago, Penemu. I also met another dragon named Tannin, although he was not a master, rather, he was Penemu's helper, as he followed all your orders. He concluded, then looked at the blonde with a chuckle. What do you say? Do you want me to teach you how to use your magic? Another big sparkle appeared in Gaspar's eyes. Could I really do this? He asked with complete emotion. Of course. He exclaimed the brunette with complete confidence. This, and much more. Issei crouched down in front of her, removing the orb. In fact, I'm sure you'll learn it much faster than I. After all, you can use magic now. 
Gaspar tightly clenched his fists. That sounds great. Did you notice something? The brunette asked, making Gaspar look at him curiously. I'm close to you, and you haven't done anything to me. Hearing this, the half-vampire couldn't help but widen his eyes in shock. That means you can control it. You just have to get rid of that feeling of insecurity, and start believing in yourself more. Issei put on a serious face, making Gaspar look at him with great attention. Everyone calls me, the weakest Sekiryote, something that can easily undermine one's faith in oneself. But despite that, I will never stop believing in myself, and I will never stop believing in the two women, who also believed in me. The leader of the fallen also believes in me, in my future. That's why even in these circumstances I have such a strong spirit, because I believe in myself, and also because there are many people who supported me and are always by my side. That, just that, makes me feel like the strongest entity in the world, even though I'm quite far from it. Issei placed a hand on Gaspar's shoulder, unable to avoid giving him a smile when he saw that that strange grey aura was not generated around him. For that reason, it is never good to be alone. If you're not like me, and you don't think you can be strong, that's fine, I completely understand. But then, lean on the people you love the most, and become someone strong, thanks to them, and above all, for them. That alone makes me feel like the strongest entity in the world, even though I'm far from it. Issei placed a hand on Gaspar's shoulder, unable to avoid giving him a smile when he saw that that strange grey aura was not generated around him. For that reason, it is never good to be alone. If you're not like me, and you don't think you can be strong, that's fine, I completely understand. But then, lean on the people you love the most, and become someone strong, thanks to them, and above all, for them. That alone makes me feel like the strongest entity in the world, even though I'm far from it. Issei placed a hand on Gaspar's shoulder, unable to avoid giving him a smile when he saw that that strange grey aura was not generated around him. For that reason, it is never good to be alone. If you're not like me, and you don't think you can be strong, that's fine, I completely understand. But then, lean on the people you love the most, and become someone strong, thanks to them, and above all, for them. If you're not like me, and you don't think you can be strong, that's fine, I completely understand. But then, lean on the people you love the most, and become someone strong, thanks to them, and above all, for them. If you're not like me, and you don't think you can be strong, that's fine, I completely understand. But then, lean on the people you love the most, and become someone strong, thanks to them, and above all, for them. Kyoto. I, I don't know what to say, the blonde commented, completely amazed by her words. The brown-haired man gave a small smile, placing a hand on Gaspar's head. You can call me Issei. Several minutes later, Issei looked towards the window, seeing that it was already getting dark. Even so, she was quite entertained by Gaspar's talks, while the half-vampire tried to materialize an orb of magic just like the chestnut. I made it, I made it. Gaspar exclaimed with great joy, making Issei look at him with a smile. That's great. Issei's eyes widened in disbelief as he saw how the magical orb was twice the size of Gaspar's. Incredible. He kept this last word to himself, completely impressed with what the blonde could be capable of. Gaspar put his two arms inside the big orb, being able to distinguish that the material was much thicker and more sensitive than Issei's, something that he liked a lot. You see it? The brunette asked, approaching Gaspar. I told you you could do it. Gaspar just nodded with a big smile. It's a little late now, but wouldn't you like to get out of this room tomorrow? He asked himself, being able to see how Gaspar seemed completely reluctant at the idea. I don't mean going out in Kuo. He quickly added, I mean a place where there are no people. It is a forest in hell that is known to the familiars who live there. It is called, the familiar realm, itself. That is where I met Tiamat, my master, and also my familiar. Issei quickly approached his ear. Even though this last part, she's just between us. Since she's a dragon, she doesn't like to be subjugated under any circumstances. He whispered lightly gracefully, an angry dragon. Gaspar thought aloud with fear, as he imagined a huge dragon spitting fire from its mouth. Something common. Since he didn't even know Tiamat's appearance, much less that the most evolved dragons should and could become humans to mate. 
So what do you say? The brunette asked, causing Gasper to look at him with a bit of doubt. Are you sure there won't be people? Asked the blonde. The place where we will stay is strictly forbidden to transit, because of, Issei couldn't help but roll his eyes when he remembered how he met Tiamat. Well, that is a story that is in the past. Even so, no one dares to get too close there, except for a few relatives. Sounds a bit scary, but exciting at the same time. Gasper commented, clenching his fists tightly, while undoing the magical robe. Count on me. In one of Kuo Academy's teacher residences, Issei entered the small apartment, completely amazed at the foreign details, denoting that Penemu also liked the French and Anglo-Saxon style. Something similar to Azazel, although he stood out for a slightly more modern design, and only looked at the current England. After seeing your room, I didn't think you had this kind of taste, the brunette clarified, completely immersed in the decoration. Well, I couldn't bring all my swords here, so, was the cadre's simple comment, sitting up on the bed. Issei couldn't help but notice that the apartment was so small, that the kitchen and the bed were in the same room, and the only thing that had a separate room seemed to be the bathroom. The cadre patted him next to her, indicating that he sit next to her. I want to train Gasper in the familiar kingdom. He commented, sitting down next to her. In the familiar kingdom? Asked the cadre. Are you sure? It's a very hostile place, and I'm sure he'll feel very uncomfortable. That's why I take him there. He lightened the brown, causing a small smile to appear on the fall's face. You've become very smart, Issei. Penemu complimented him, giving him a small kiss on her cheek, making Issei blush slightly. I wonder whose fault it will be, she asked herself, while looking at her with a small smile. Penemu only managed to cover her mouth to prevent her little giggle from being more audible, something that made her look even more cute. Well, I guess I'll go, said Issei, getting up, to be stopped by Penemu when she tugged on his sleeve slightly. Don't forget about your studies. More than a reminder, it seemed like an order, and the look on her face only affirmed this fact. Issei couldn't help but get slightly nervous at her gaze. Don't worry, we'll go with Gasper after the academy. Hearing this, Penemu nodded in satisfaction and let him go. At the Hyodo house, I'm here. He commented on the chestnut, seeing that his parents seemed not to have given him a degree of importance, while they continued reading the newspaper. Issei saw that they hadn't even left him his dinner, so he heaved a big sigh. The chestnut was going to go up to his room, but he stopped in the middle of the stairs. Tomorrow is the day the parents go to the academy. The chestnut commented, without even looking at them. Could you at least take some time for me tomorrow? He asked. Seconds passed, and he didn't get any response, making him lower his head a little. I thought so. He whispered under his breath, going to his room. When he entered his room, the first thing he saw was Tiamat sitting on his bed. How was it? The dragon asked, moving slightly to the side to make room for Issei. Not bad. She answered the brunette, sitting next to her. I think he has a big trust issue, but he's a good guy. Apparently, demonic corruption doesn't affect him, which is strange. I already told you that it seemed to be damaged, the dragon replied. Most likely, something went wrong when he was reincarnated. Gasper had said something about that, but he didn't give too many details. I don't think he should know the exact reason either. The brown-haired man answered, remembering the talk with the blonde. Gasper. Tiamat asked, cocking her head curiously. That's his name. Issei replied. I see. The dragon answered, then smiled a little when she heard how Issei's noise made a strange sound. Sorry, I just didn't eat anything. He answered the brunette, completely embarrassed. Don't worry. She replied the dragon, clasping her hands together as a small magic circle appeared. I made you something, she concluded, making Issei's eyes widen wildly as he watched as a plate of hot food came out of the magic circle and fell into Tiamat's hands, who carefully handed it over to him. Tiamat, you are the best, the brown-haired man exclaimed, while comical tears came out of his face. She only gave him a cute smile after her words, where the tip of her beautiful fangs could be seen. This is delicious, he yelled, while eating like crazy. Damn. I think you've become a much better cook than me. He looked up from her for a brief second, looking at her with great admiration. You are just wonderful, he concluded, causing a small blush to appear on Tiamat's face. 
Issei kept eating like crazy, but he stopped drastically when the dragon lifted his face with her hands and gave him a kiss on the forehead. Eat more calmly, or you will choke. She commented with a small smile, while that slight blush still covered her face, making her look beautiful. Issei couldn't do anything but blush, as he nodded slowly. At that moment, he realized that there was something strange in the environment. He quickly swallowed the food and began to sniff like a dog. Wait. What's that smell? Curse. Tiamat thought, clearly nervous. It's a strange smell. The brunette commented. It's a new perfume. She answered quickly, causing Issei to look at her with a raised eyebrow. I decorated it in your room. I hope you like it. It was clearly a perfect excuse. Hmm. That's fine. She replied Issei with a smile. It's a very nice smell. She continued, causing Tiamat to put her hands on his cheeks to cover the huge blush that had formed. What is the perfume? I would like to buy it. He finished, giving her a big smile. Shibabaramuno. Tiamat muttered in a very low tone, while looking away. That, the brunette asked, rubbing his hair. Tiamat looked at him again, still covering her cheeks. You are a secret. The next day, silent laughter could be heard in the early hours of the morning at the Hyodo residence. These sounds came from a specific room. Wait. Don't touch me there. The dragon's voice was easily heard through the door. She tickles me a lot. She added her, while the noise of the creaking bed was heard with great ease. Finally, the image of Issei falling on Tiamat could be seen. I win. She commented on the brunette with a victorious smile on his face, as she watched as Tiamat panted beneath him from exhaustion. Right now, it's where Diedrake was wondering how his partner couldn't have any obscene thoughts, when he had the most beautiful dragon in her underwear, panting with a small blush on her face, while completely at his mercy. I give up, she exclaimed the dragon between gasps, to later see how Issei moved to the side of her, freeing her from her. Will you introduce me to your new friend? Asked the dragon, which didn't take a second to accommodate her head on her chest. No, was the chestnut's response, beginning to caress the woman's hair. I have a plan, and I need your help. He finished, making the dragon raise her face a little, looking at him curiously. What is it about? End of the chapter. Issei opened his eyes with difficulty, only to look from side to side to discover that he was in a completely dark place. Where I am, wondered the brown-haired man who didn't have much time to search for an answer, since some hands landed on his shoulders. Hands so delicate that it was impossible to forget them. Issei quickly turned around, giving an instant smile to the two women he loved the most in this world. Tiamat and Penemu hugged him, something Issei responded to instantly, as he looked at the large photo of his birthday above the heads of the Kadri and the Dragoness, unable to help but widen his smile at the memory. How did they manage to make him happy in such a short time? It was something he was still trying to understand, but he didn't really care. He didn't care, as long as they were close to him. The brunette's gaze twisted to an incredulous look when the photo caught on fire, and it burned almost instantly. At that moment, Issei's gaze was mixed with a great deal of horror and hatred as Tiamat and Penemu transformed into Rainair, who gave him a ghastly smile, and proceeded to say. Will you die for me? Issei stood up suddenly, while he was breathing heavily and a great deal of sweat covered his entire face. He quickly held his head, making a poor attempt to deal with what his body was feeling right now. Hmm. Tiamat's voice was heard as she poked her face out from under the covers. Don't leave me, the sleeping dragon commented as she snuggled further into Issei with a face that seemed to be quite hurt. Seeing this, Issei put his dream aside for a moment, and proceeded to fix the hair that covered the dragon's face. I am not going anywhere. She whispered to him. I'll just make breakfast. Wait in bed for me. A small smile appeared on the dragon after her words, and she said something that caught the chestnut a little off guard. I love you so much, Issei. Issei stared at him for a few seconds, until he finally smiled at him. Me too, Tiamat. She returned the feeling, unable to control herself. As she kissed him on the cheek. When the dragon was like this, she was too cute to be able to resist her. I'll be back in a minute. She affirmed her chestnut, rising from the bed, making Tiamat frown as she felt her usual warmth leave her. Still, it wasn't strong enough to wake her. Probably, because of the words that she had given the chestnut of hers. Issei began to go down the stairs, 
then leaned on the railing and held his stomach tightly, because the dream he had was still tormenting him. Shit, he's coming again, he thought, while his eyes began to tremble and they formed tears, which didn't take long to fall. Whenever I am with them I am very happy, and I am very happy to see that the cold attitude has already vanished in them. Although Penemu is still so serious, but on many occasions she shows me her feelings, and her smile. Issei couldn't help but squeeze her stomach even harder when the most beautiful smiles from both women passed through her head. Shit, her smiles, I get so happy just remembering them, Issei gritted his teeth as the tears began to fall faster. Even so, even so, this feeling keeps coming from time to time, a feeling of unbearable pain and emptiness, she thought, leaning her forehead against the railing. First it began with Tiamat, and now Penemu is also added. It's like some kind of price I have to pay for being so happy. Now that the two of them make me so happy, these unpleasant sensations have become twice as strong every time they appear. Asterisk with your sorrows again, partner. Diedrag asked with a clear worried tone, receiving a forced nod from the brown-haired man. Asterisk this is the fault of your trauma. Your dragon emotions are quite problematic under these circumstances. But what do those two have to do with Rainair? He exclaimed the brunette with a lot of annoyance, hitting the railing hard. Rainair was a bloody bitch, while Tiamat and Penemu are the women I hold dearest in this life. As I told you the first time, it's something you must discover on your own. The dragon commented seriously, asterisk but, you shouldn't let it get the better of you. After all, you could suffer even bigger mental breakdowns in the future. It's very dangerous, as you could activate your juggernaut drive out of sheer desperation and rage. Issei stopped shaking, and took a deep breath. You're right, the brunette looked up from him, pressing his forehead hard against the railing, stopping his tears. Even so, I assure you that I will find the answer to what torments me. I'm sure if, he commented on the dragon to himself, then looked up from him. The question is, when will it be? And, if that sensation will increase even more with the possible arrival of other women that I love. Diedreg closed his eyes calmly, crossing his arms. But looking at her growing character and personality, I doubt she'll be able to fall in love with more than four women. A small smile appeared on the dragon's face as he opened his eyes. Now that I think back, four wives is the average number of wives a dragon has. Perhaps he's just wishing there were four so that he would have another similar point with dragons. He concluded, then laughed at his own words. What am I saying? He is a reincarnated devil, not a dragon. Chapter 30. New Teachings in the Family Kingdom. Issei entered the old academy building, to see how their president was sitting at the desk, which now actually belonged to Azazel, since he was the one instructing them. Putting that aside, he could see that the redhead had an unsympathetic face. Do you know what happened to the seals in the forbidden room? The question quickly cleared up the cause of her mood. Actually, that's why he asks you to come before class. He commented the brunette, putting his hands in his pockets and leaning against the door. Are you telling me it was you? Rias frowned. He had strictly told you that. You never told me there was a child locked in there. He interrupted the brunette, causing Rias to lightly clench her teeth. Do not change the subject. She exclaimed the redhead, hitting the desk. No. He confronted her instantly. You don't change the subject. He raised her voice, clearly annoyed, causing Rias to be surprised by an attitude that he had rarely, if ever, seen in Issei. How can you keep someone locked up for years? Look, Rias gave a small sigh, completely calming down. It's kind of hard to understand. That's why I'm asking you. The chestnut insisted, stepping impatiently. His piece is mutated, and that makes him different from us. He's dangerous, Rias explained, causing the brunette to raise an eyebrow. He didn't evolve like any reincarnated devil would, and we can't help him for that reason. Is he dangerous because he's different from us? Issei asked, to then ask another question. What's different? That he's a kid who's scared to talk to his own shadow. That he's made to believe that he's dangerous to everyone. That he has a slightly problematic power unlike us. Issei couldn't help but frown again. That's just why they locked him up. Did they even try to do anything before? Did they try to figure it out? We don't understand human problems very well. That's why we are devils. Rias explained with a frown. Hearing the answer, Issei couldn't help but raise both eyebrows. And according to you, 
what makes us different? She asked herself, causing Rias to widen her eyes at him. Curse. She thought the redhead, realizing that she had talked too much when she was harassed by questions. That doesn't matter. What's more, at what point did you become a questioner? The president asked, deflecting the subject. Issei just stepped forward, and looked at her seriously. I began to ask myself questions, because the answers are necessary to understand the contexts. She concluded, walking past Rias. Apparently, the young woman had not discovered the true meaning behind her words. If she had noticed, she would have found out that she was further than she thought from being able to manipulate the brunette again. Where are you going? The redhead asked, curious. I'll go see how he is. Was Issei's simple response, making Rias frown. I forbid you. We will put seals again. He is someone very dangerous. She ordered, only to have her eyes widen as Issei continued to move forward, disregarding her words. Issei. I am your master. You must abide by everything I tell you. If no one is going to help him, I'll help him Rias. He yelled the brunette, causing the young woman's body to shudder upon hearing that Issei didn't tell her president, and the chill only increased with the sidelong glance that her servant gave him. It's fine I understand it. Rias answered quickly. But there's no need for you to be like that. Issei just sighed at what he heard. No need. The brunette shook his head with clear disappointment. I shouldn't have yelled at you, I'm sorry. But, your words are too, stinging. Issei said it in the best way he could think of, due to her not wanting to make Rias angry either. As long as he left Gasper in his hands, there was no need to create a conflict between them. Although that did not mean that he continued to have him on the same pedestal as always. I get it, you're right. Rias replied with a smile. I'm sorry too, I guess I should have tried harder. Issei just smiled at his words, thinking that the redhead had realized his mistake. Finally, Issei disappeared from her sight, causing Rias's smile to fade and she to hold her head in annoyance. I almost ruined everything, she whispered under her breath, rubbing her hair. But what the hell happened to Hyodo? She bit her thumb. Why did she change herself so suddenly? Before she was much more manipulable. She thought to herself, then became very serious. I'd better act as fast as possible. Otherwise, I might not make it in time due to Issei losing all ignorance of her. That was what she thought to herself, though she couldn't even do anything about it now. Not because she wasn't attractive, but because Issei already had two beautiful and wonderful women whom he loved with all his being, although he still didn't want to realize it. One hour later, Issei was sitting on his chair with great boredom. He only deigned to watch as all his classmates were with his parents, except him, because they were too, busy, to attend to him. The first few times it happened at his other schools he felt great shame, but currently, that shame had been replaced with annoyance. The brown-haired man couldn't wander much more in his thoughts, as he looked up with quite a bit of surprise to see Tiamat and Penemu entering, greeting the other parents, and the professor. Finally, they stopped next to him, and they both gave him a small smile. In Penemu's case, she was barely distinguishable. What are you doing here? The chestnut asked with quite intrigue. We don't have normal classes today. You two didn't have to come. He explained to her making her even more confused when the two women widened their smiles a bit more. You see, since we are 25 years old, and one of us is living with you, Penemu commented. We thought it would be a good idea to sign us up as your guardian. That way, you won't be alone. Tiamat completed the idea of the cadre. From one second to the next, Issei's face lit up dramatically as comical tears streamed down his face. They are the best, she exclaimed, hugging them both tightly. This caused everyone to look at him uncertainly. Even so, none of the three boasted of the looks, since they were very involved in the affectionate embrace. After a few minutes, the teacher and parents posed at the front of the room, while everyone listened carefully to what he was going to say. Before we start art class, we'd like everyone to share their wishes once they're adults. The professor commented, causing Issei to roll his eyes, because he was already 18 years old, and technically, he was already an adult. Although he understood that the man was referring to a desire even more in the future. For starters, we'll start with the ladies. The teacher was naming the girls one by one, making the brown-haired man start to sweat more and more at the same answers. When I grow up, 
I want to marry someone tall and handsome who has a lot of money. Some added various university or tertiary studies, but all conclusions were the same. Are all the girls in my class so materialistic? He thought the brunette out loud, making Ika hear him. Not all. The young woman commented, adjusting her glasses with a smile. Some already really think they want the future, not princess dreams and all that shit. She concluded herself, making Issei nod. Still, it was worrisome to see that so many women in his grade seemed to have little brains. In fact, he probably wouldn't have much of a brain either, if he had never entered the supernatural world, so he couldn't complain either. He also began to wonder if Penemu and Tiamat were materialists, for some strange reason. He didn't know why that thought crossed his mind, though he quickly answered it in the negative, since the attitudes of the women seemed to be completely opposed to materialism. In fact, Penemu bathes in money, and has never seen her buy anything out of the ordinary, except for that maid's outfit, which she bought only for himself. That last thing made a smile cross his face at the memory. Hyodo Issei. Brown woke up from his infused sleep when he heard the teacher say his name. What is your wish in the future? The man asked, raising an eyebrow. At that moment, he felt that many gazes were on him, mainly those of Matsuda, Motohama, Tiamat, and Penemu. A small smile appeared on the brunette's face. Well, my first wish is to defeat Tiamat in combat and win the bet. My second wish is to save as many as I can and try to rewrite the prophecy of the apocalypse. And my third wish is to succeed in the I Battle Valley by myself, without any help, he thought, shaking his head slightly. But, obviously, I can't say that, or they would take me crazy. The only thing I know is that all those desires lead to the same and unique feeling, Issei looked up, and gave the professor a smile. My wish for the future is to be happy. Everyone smiled at his answer, even the teacher himself nodded several times. Something concise, but very practical. The teacher commented. I like it. I hope you have luck with it. He concluded, then looked at Matsuda. And you, Matsuda. After everyone expressed their wishes, the art class finally started. And again, Issei had to make a sculpture, although instead of using ice, this time it was another material. Think of something you like. Issei remembered Tiamat's words, so he raised his hands to the sculpture that simply resembled a ball of mud at that time. He closed her eyes deeply, and let her mind flow. Something I like, he thought, frowning slightly. I already made Tiamat, so this time, the chestnut's mind began to flood with memories of Penemu. His always serious look, her tears, their beautiful smiles, and finally, he remembered the first time he saw her in the cursed forest, along with the first confrontation they had. His black robe that completely covered his body. I remembered it perfectly. He even had to admit that she looked quite beautiful when she made her combat stance with her katana. Issei's eyes widened as many gasps took place in the room. He looked down from her, seeing that he had rendered the figure of Penemu in perfect detail. He was exactly like her when they faced each other that time. Penemu was able to observe the sculpture from afar, so she couldn't help but blink several times in great surprise. At that moment, Tiamat whispered something in his ear. The dragon's words had made Penemu lower her face a little to try to cover the small blush that appeared on her cheeks. Surely Tiamat had told him how Issei got that inspiration and talent when he thought of something he really liked. Hey Issei! Matsuda exclaimed, taking out a porno magazine. Make one of these for me. The bald man pointed to the image of a naked woman, and shortly after was hit on the head by Murayama. Several minutes later, it's very pretty, Penemu commented, holding the small figurine very delicately with both of her hands, as if it would break with a single breath. Although it was almost impossible to witness, she was smiling. The three of them were behind a tree in the courtyard, a little apart from the others. What can I say? He commented the brunette, rubbing his hair with a smile. I try to do the best I can. I have one too. From her Tiamat added, raising her hands, and causing a small magic circle to appear and drop her statuette. Do you still have it? Issei asked, quite surprised at the revelation. Of course. She exclaimed the dragon with a beautiful smile, as she pressed the statuette against her chest. It's a present from you, after all. She concluded, making Issei rub her hair again at her sincere words. Some time later. A large amount of crowd was rushing towards the gym when a so-called idol 
had arrived at Kuo Academy. Issei was practically swept off his feet by his two best friends, though to be honest he was mildly curious. After finding out that it was Sona's sister, named Seraphal, he couldn't help but be a little impressed to see another Mao, especially that he looked so young, and also, having a rather childish attitude, at the same time seductive, since he even attracted women with his way of being. Something a bit strange according to Issei, although she didn't interest him too much either. After all, I was much more immersed in another image. How can they like it so much? She thought the chestnut with a smile, while she looked outside as Tiamat and Penemu were under a tree, talking excitedly about their own sculptures. Perhaps, I should give them a present, she concluded, her smile growing a little more as she saw how both women seemed to get along very well. After all, they were together almost all the time. Hey Issei, Matsuda yelled at him, are you listening to me? The brunette couldn't help but look at him confused. We were discussing if it's a perfect cosplay. Motohama explained, adjusting her glasses. I think it's perfect. But he says it would be perfect, only if Seraphal was smaller. I think it's alright, was Issei's simple response, causing Motohama to deliver a triumphant smile to Matsuda, who only deigned to grit his teeth in defense. In the family kingdom, Gaspar stared at the outside of the cave in amazement. It was natural, since he hadn't left that room in years, plus he had never visited hell. The colors that the forest where the familiars lived were extremely different from the forests that could be seen on earth. The vampire turned around to see how Issei was preparing a small fire while taking out some juice boxes and some sandwiches from his backpack. Gaspar couldn't help but look at him quite curiously, as a rather sentimental look came over him. What's going on? She asked herself, causing Issei to look at him for a short second, before looking back into the cave. Did you know that this place was covered in ice before? The brunette responded with another question, making Gaspar's eyes light up. That ice was not natural. It was generated by my first master. Let's just say that she didn't like living with others very much, and that she was also quite territorial back then. He commented, then laughed for a second as he remembered how they met. Actually, when I entered the zone because of an argument I had with Deidre, that's when I met her, and she obviously wanted to kill me. Although, she also had her own reasons for wanting my death, or rather, Deidre's death. Gaspar couldn't help but sit next to him when he heard the story, waiting for him to tell him more, something that the brunette noticed. Let's just say I was saved by a miracle. And, after that, she let me go, although after seeing her face, seeing that she was so alone. Issei remembered Tiamat's expressionless face on that occasion, although he could not hide the great loneliness that her beautiful light blue eyes conveyed. So, I decided to stay with her for a couple of days. She. Tiamat did not deny that she was very grateful for such a fact, so she decided to train me as a token of her gratitude. Issei gave a couple of sandwiches to Gaspar, who began to eat them unconsciously as he continued to listen to the story. In the end, those days they turned into a long month due to a certain circumstance. She taught me to fight, and take advantage of my opponent's shortcomings, as well as giving me my first orientations in the supernatural world and telling me different lessons so that I could learn to survive in this world. And what was that circumstance? You mentioned earlier. He asked himself, quite excited to listen at the thought of hearing another great story. Well, it's another long story, Issei commented, approaching the forest. You see, there was a guy named Razor. Issei continued telling his story, as he entered the site along with the half-vampire. Several hours later, she keeps coming back to that dark cave even though she already lives with you. Gaspar asked with slight disbelief, as he was looking at all the vegetation in general. The vampire carried a large quantity of fruit in his backpack, indicating that they had been gathering food for the night. I didn't understand it at first either. But, when I got back to the cave, it was like a revelation to me. Issei stopped, giving him a smile that surprised Gaspar. After all, that was where he abandoned his solitude, and where he lived his first happy moments after a long time. Luckily, I have Matsuda and Motohama, but even so, going back to that place gave me a hit of nostalgia. Quite big, since it's only been a few months since I was last there. Gaspar stopped for a short second, then nodded with a smile. I think I get it. Sure you understand. He answered the chestnut, looking forward when he heard a strange movement. After all, 
you went through circumstances very similar to mine and hers. Before Gasper could say anything else, his eyes widened as feline beasts began to approach the duo, with no friendly intentions. The vampire was no fool, and he was able to pick up on those intentions, but. Don't come near, he whispered under his breath. I don't want to hurt them. Gasper's eyes widened as an intense crimson glow took over the environment for a short second, to later see how Issei took several steps forward with his balance breaker activated. The chestnut shadowed his gaze and lowered his face, causing a rather imposing crimson aura to surround him completely. The beasts began to recoil in fear from such a powerful presence, and quickly fled. Seeing this, Issei undid his armor and looked at him with slight concern. Are you okay? He asked her. Gasper couldn't help but look down sadly. Sorry to be a bother. Hearing his words, Issei walked over and placed a hand on his shoulder, causing the vampire to look up. You're learning, you're not a bother. She answered, causing a small smile to appear on the vampire's face. This place is pretty hostile, so if they come at you with bad intentions, don't be afraid to beat them up. After all, they are asking for it. He exclaimed the brunette, giving a thumbs up in response. Gasper couldn't help lowering his gaze again. But, I don't want to harm. No problem. The brunette interrupted him, adding a toothy grin to his thumbs up. In that case, I'll protect you. Hearing those words, a big smile appeared on the vampire. When they follow their path towards the forest, Issei couldn't help but stop for a short second to tell her a few last words on the matter. Still, there will be times when I need you to protect me. Gasper couldn't help but widen his eyes at his words. Not just me, I'm sure you'll find more people valuable to you who will be in danger and you'll have to protect them, or both cover your back, depending on the situation. That's the world we live in, and if you don't adapt to it, you might regret it in the future. He concluded, without even looking at his face, and then continued advancing. Gasper pondered over his words for a few seconds, before following him again. A few hours later, back in the cave, the only light present was from the campfire, as darkness had closed in on the vast forest of familiars. Wow, the one with the black hair is amazing. Gasper exclaimed, while he ate with a big sparkle in his eyes. Her name is, Penemu. He commented the brunette gracefully, imagining how the cadre would react if she had listened to Gasper right now. The talk about his second master was interrupted with a small growl, followed by a loud bulge that hit Issei's chest and knocked him to the ground. Gasper couldn't help but jump in fear, to later see that it was a small dragon. Oh, it's you, he exclaimed the brunette, caressing the little girl's head with joy. It already seems strange to me that you didn't show up all day. Gasper couldn't help but watch the interaction between the two of them with quite amazement. You should not fear her, she is a friend. The chestnut commented, making the little dragon look from her to the little vampire. She tried to get closer, but Gasper took several steps back, due to his condition. Why are you afraid? The brunette asked, making both of them look at him, especially Gasper. She's not going to hurt you. So why should you? Are you afraid of doing it by accident? A small smile appeared on Issei's face as the vampire nodded. In that case, I should have been dead a long time ago. The brunette stood up and crossed his arms. They made you believe that you can't control your power. In fact, you can't, but you are the only one who decides whether to activate it or not. When you activate it, you do it simply to put a shield between you and that person, because because you distrust that entity, and yourself. Issei gave him a big chuckle. Don't you think it's time to change that? Gasper looked at him suspiciously for several seconds, before nodding. He squeezed his eyes shut as the little dragon began to sniff him. Finally, he opened his eyes wide thanks to the fact that the little girl was insisting with her muzzle that he caress her head. The vampire simply raised her hand and rested it on the dragon's head, so that later she herself lay on Gasper's lap and began to sleep peacefully. You see, he commented the brunette, sitting next to him. It's not that bad. Gasper just nodded with a big smile. At Kuo Academy, I already brought it back as promised, said Issei, while he was leaning on the edge of the terrace of the old building, together with Rias. Yes, and I see that things turned out well, since he seemed happy. Was the simple response of the redhead, while she looked at the stars. How much time do you think he needs? If all goes according to plan, in a few weeks you can be in Kuo. 
She answered the chestnut. I see. Rias lowered her gaze, looking at him for a short second. Issei. What do you think of love? The brown-haired man couldn't help but look at her with quite some uncertainty after the subject. Well that's pretty sudden. Issei rubbed his cheek, thinking hard. I guess. Can it be good and bad? More than an answer. It was a question, making it clear that she had no idea about it. I mean, I had very bad experiences, just like you. But, I think if you choose the right person, it could be something. Issei looked up, and although he didn't know the reason, the image of Penemu and Tiamat faded. They crossed him for a short second. Indescribable, was the answer, something that surprised Rias, since he noticed the depth in that word. I guess you're right, Rias replied, before smiling. What kind of woman would you like to fall in love with? What type? Issei couldn't help but repeat the question, thinking carefully. Well, personally, I don't like to think about that kind of thing because of what happened to me. But, I guess my thoughts are still the same, I think. Issei couldn't help but raise an eyebrow, since she hadn't thought about love for several months. I've always really liked women who have an excellent physique, although the answer was quite obvious, Issei began to doubt his own words, because he was realizing that he hadn't felt any kind of physical attraction towards him for a long time. Women, with the exception of specific cases. That doesn't mean that he has become less of a man, he just feels that his tastes have changed, or haven't they? It was all very confusing for him, since the faces and personalities of Tiamat and Penemu was something that he could consider attractive now, but the bodies of the two of them were also heart-stopping, and he was not a fool to ignore that. But, the strange thing begins when he can only think of the two of them, as if there were no other women in the world, because the dragon and the cadre had no point of comparison in any of the aspects he thought before. Why were they both so beautiful? Why were the two of them so perfect? Yes, it was very strange. Do I look attractive to you? Rias asked, not realizing that Issei was too deep in thought about him to answer him honestly. Yeah, it was the simple answer of the chestnut while he continued thinking about Tiamat and Penemu. Which part? She asked herself, really interested in the answer. Physical, personality, or character? He asked the brunette, narrowing his eyes as a mental image of his pretty dragon smiling appeared in his mind. Um, physical? Rias asked, genuinely shocked that Issei was being so blunt, since he didn't seem like that kind of person. The butt, was the chestnut's immediate response, remembering Tiamat's large, soft, soft, and well-formed rear. Although the dragon had bigger breasts and much better than Rias's, she still thought that her butt was something frankly unmatched. Sort of like Penemu's breasts. The butt. Rias couldn't help but wonder internally as he looked at himself. I thought my breasts were much better than my ass, she concluded, genuinely amazed at the brunette's response. Would you like to have dinner today? Rias asked making Issei finally wake up from the thoughts of him. That is to say, we are master and servant, and we haven't interacted with each other at all. And, it's been several months since you joined the nobility. To me, you are my faithful comrades. She answered the chestnut with a small smile. Although I no longer owe you my life, nothing would have been possible without you, so we don't need to interact with each other to get along, because we already do. Issei turned to the moon, unable to help but smile. But, you're right, dinner at my house wouldn't hurt. I'm sure my parents wouldn't mind. She concluded, making a big smile appear on the redhead's face. See you in an hour then. She exclaimed happily, saying goodbye to the brunette, who simply responded with a greeting. I guess I should go too, he said to himself, putting his hands in his pockets and walking out of the terrace. In the Hyodo residence, Dad Mom, Issei yelled, seeing that there was no one in the house. Damn, the brunette thought with slight annoyance. At least, they could let me know when they take those business trips, he concluded, before looking towards the stairs, and outlining a small smile. Apparently, Tiamat is still with Penemu, she thought aloud, unable to help but widen her smile. It's amazing to see how the two of them have become so close. Especially for them, who have always been so alone, she finished to then see the large amount of material that she had left over from the academy, still on top of the table. Before I make dinner, maybe I should make that gift, she thought, taking the material stored in the bag, while she took her photo album and went up to the room to start working. One hour later, smells so good, 
Rias commented with a smile, entering the Hyodo residence. Thank you. Issei thanked, leading her into the kitchen. You are alone. Rias asked, seeing that no one was there. My parents have gone on a trip, and Tiamat is still with Penemu. The brunette answered, only to see how Rias stopped. That's much better for me, she thought with a sly tone, as she gave a small glance to her bag. Can you tell me where the bathroom is? Yes, it's this way. He answered the chestnut, guiding her. Issei sat down, serving the food on both plates, only to look at Rias in quite a bit of astonishment as she returned to the kitchen. Rias was wearing a rather extravagant black outfit. A fabric that acts as a collar on her neck gave off a small linear fabric that crossed over her bra, and ended up joining another equally thin fabric a little above her navel. From there, different folds were detached that exposed her navel, in addition to two other bras that were in charge of holding the long transparent stockings. Her dress also featured panties, which, like her bra, were linked to her dress, making everything one. A large part of the cloth was quite transparent, except in key places. How I look? She asked, turning around, making Issei see that another bra was coming from the nape of her neck to her panties and that it acted like a lace, holding her up. Is it a lingerie? The brunette asked, unable to avoid raising an eyebrow. Why did you bring that? Hearing the brunette's question, Rias could feel her plan slowly breaking down. Well, I just wanted to show you, because I thought, Issei waved his hand dismissively. It's not that bad, but it really makes me uncomfortable to see you like that. Issei found the nicest way to tell him, not to mention that he was grossed out by him. Probably, this disgust towards women's bodies had been created when he promised himself that he would never indulge in lustful desires again. Well, that's what he thought, since he has been seen thinking a couple of times in a not-so-holy way about Tiamat and Penemu, although the cases have been quite rare. That last one only makes it funnier that someone like Rias would think she could get his attention, if not even the two women he considers most beautiful have had much an effect on him. Can you change? Uh, of course, I just wanted to show you. Rias commented with a rather nervous smile on his face, seeing that nothing had turned out the way he wanted. I haven't liked those kinds of clothes for quite some time. It's not something that's due to you, it's something personal. She lightened the brown at the end making the redhead feel not so bad. If you're looking to impress a man you like, maybe you should talk to Akino about it, she's more clear about it. Issei deduced, because she couldn't find another explanation for Rias showing up in those outfits. Finally, Rias got changed and heaved a big sigh, before throwing the lingerie into the trash can that was in the living room. His plan had failed, but he also realized that he had gone too fast, and that he didn't know Issei's current tastes, so it would be best to act more cautiously from now on. The two of them had dinner together, in what seemed like a great progress to Rias, since Issei seemed to be quite content with her presence, besides that he seemed not to be bothered by her little incitements. What Rias didn't know is that Issei was very bad at those topics because of his trauma in the past, which made him believe that no woman could be interested in someone like him. Therefore, he was not responding to anything, he was just being polite. A few hours later, Rias had finally left, and Issei had already finished the gifts to the two women. Speaking of which, Issei looked towards the door when he heard it open, and quickly headed there to see Penemu and Tiamat, who seemed to be talking very happily. Amongst themselves, welcome, the brown-haired man exclaimed, with a big smile between his teeth, also giving a quick greeting to Penemu, who responded with her usual lack of energy although the smile on his face indicated that he was quite happy at the moment. How has everything turned out? Tiamat asked, patting the chestnut's face with both hands. All good, she answered Issei with a bit of effort due to the dragon's hands. You, Tiamat broke away, unable to help but laugh. I've been helping him cook a bit, he commented, looking at her with a face full of grace. You should have seen her, she almost burned down her entire apartment. She exclaimed, causing a huge flush of embarrassment to shoot across the cadre's face. That's why I always ask for food, she whispered slightly shyly as she averted her gaze to the side, making them both laugh. Before you go, let me give you a present, he declared the chestnut, causing Penemu to look at him with great curiosity. Issei took a statuette out of the bag, where she, Tiamat and he were. This is when we celebrate my birthday. 
she declared herself, seeing that the three figures were in exactly the same pose in that photo. Since you like the sculpture I made for you so much, I thought this would be a good idea. She finished, handing it over. Penemu received it with her two open hands, causing a great shine to come from her crimson eyes when she saw that the expression full of feelings of the three was perfectly captured. A beautiful smile covered Penemu's face as she pressed the sculpture to her breasts. It's very cute. Thank you. She thanked with great sincerity, causing the brunette to give her a toothy smile in response. I have one for you too, Tiamat. He commented to her, taking the last one out of the bag and handing it over. That way, you won't have to worry if it thaws out. He concluded, seeing how a sparkle ran through his eyes, very similar to Penemu's. I'll really appreciate it. Really, the dragon declared with a beautiful smile on her face, causing Issei to give a thumbs up in response. The next day, Issei opened his weary eyes, only to see how a huge bulge was raised on his own hips. The sheets were pulled back, revealing the beautiful dragon as she stretched out her body and gave a small yawn. How strange that you're awake. Issei sneered, remembering that Tiamat rarely wakes up this early in the morning. Now that he thought about it, this habit that Tiamat had acquired of sleeping with him was quite pleasant. It's strange to think that the need to sleep together in that cave because of the cold became so routine in the future, even though there isn't a real need today. I can't help it, she answered the dragon, arranging the hair that covered her face. He's too snug and hot. It was her simple response that made her brunette shake her head, amused. Issei tried to get up, but Tiamat stopped him with her soft hands pressing against his chest. I want to return the favor of yesterday. She commented the dragon, giving him a beautiful smile. Let me make you breakfast. Issei lay back on the bed and smiled. All right, it's all yours. Tiamat came downstairs in her full underwear, not caring about the fact what that meant, since Issei's parents weren't there, and all the curtains were closed. If she missed something from her past life, it was the fact that she could walk naked in her human form everywhere without anyone saying anything to her. After all, that was what dragons were like. While Tiamat waited for the water to heat up, she observed herself in the mirror in the living room, so she couldn't help but take the statuette where the three of them were together and put it in the mirror, seeing that she was exactly the same. She was like that, for a short second, until she visualized something strange in the garbage can thanks to the mirror. What is this? The dragon wondered aloud, removing the lingerie outfit that Rias had worn the night before. Is it some kind of underwear? She wondered herself, looking at it in more detail, being slightly surprised by the details of it. Hum. I like it. She concluded with a small smile. Issei hurried to strap on his belt, unable to help but look at himself in the mirror. I have a lot of money to buy more clothes, but I've gotten really used to wearing the academy clothes, the brown-haired man thought with a little nervous drop of sweat. Issei. Did he bring you breakfast or are you coming? Now down. She answered quickly putting on her shoes at the speed of light, then descending the stairs with the same speed. The chestnut couldn't help but put on a goofy expression as he sniffed the sweet aroma of the food. I hope you like it. She declared the dragon with a big smile, putting a tray on the table. When he saw her, Issei's eyes nearly bulged out of their sockets. Wah 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 what? Issei cheekily pointed at her, causing Tiamat to look at herself. Oh, this, she wondered herself pointing to the lingerie she was wearing. It's some underwear I saw in the trash. I thought it was cute enough to throw away. She commented with complete innocence. Although, I must say that she fits me quite tight. She reached her hand to the top of her gigantic cleavage, where her breasts were threatening to burst the fabric. Issei's eyes couldn't help but linger on that very spot as he was so tight that the dragon's nipples were completely molded into the fabric. Although, I must say that she squeezes me a lot more here. She turned around, pointing to her behind, where Issei's face turned completely red when he saw how the cloth was almost completely sunk in the middle of her buttocks. Especially because of this bra. And yes, the obvious had to happen. Whoa! Issei screamed and flew, crashing down the stairs after the enormous amount of blood that came out of her nose. Issei. Tiamat cried out in great concern, rushing to him. Are you okay? She asked the dragon picking him up gently as she let her face rest on her breast. She only grew more concerned seeing Issei's unconscious face was completely pale from excessive bloodshed. 
Issei seemed to want to wake up, but he only had the strength to say a couple of words, and they were the following. I couldn't resist the neutron style. And so, that's how the brat had a runny nose after months, Diedreg commented to himself very gracefully. End of the first part. Oh wait sorry there's actually more. Lord Odin, it is a letter from the angels. A beautiful, voluptuous woman with long silver hair and soft blue eyes wearing black and white armor burst into the room. The angels. Odin wondered, who was lying sitting on the desk. How strange, we haven't communicated since what happened with Trihexa, he whispered to himself, before extending his hand. Give me the letter, Rossweiss. The now recognized as Rossweiss quickly complied with his order and handed it over. The god read the letter, surprised by its content, to then outline a smile. Interesting. Very interesting. He exclaimed, slamming the desk hard causing the Valkyrie to look at him in great confusion. Get ready, Rossweiss. You'll be accompanying me to a meeting in two weeks. Wait, come here. Gasper exclaimed happily as he chased after the little dragon, trying to catch her. His parents were present this time, not like the first time he went alone. Issei deigned to watch the entire interaction with a small smile. I think he's ready, he told himself internally, seeing how he had fun without any problems. Shortly. After, he couldn't help but frown at a thought that had been eating away at him for the last few days. According to what the president told me two weeks ago, the mutated pieces are the cause of their not suffering from demonic corruption, and that's why they are considered a glitch, even though it boosts reincarnation, and therefore the general stats of its user. Even the brunette himself looked a bit surprised by using such specific words, but quickly put that aside. What bothers me? is that some sort of peace had already been created for the demonic corruption not to act, and that very fix is taken as a bug. It's quite ironic, since the bug is that same corruption in the first place, because it corrupts people, Issei couldn't help but sigh, something the dragon's parents caught. She also mentioned something of the difference between humans and devils. Maybe that's the explanation why more mutated pieces weren't made. The brunette rubbed his hair hard in annoyance. I'm thinking too much about it. Also, I'm fine that they've been discontinued, if that means more people end up like Gasper, completely cut off from the world. Or killing them. Diedreg interrupted in her mind, making Issei wince a little. The current devils may have their ways, but I doubt they would be able to go to such an extent. He answered her in her mind, making Diedreg frown. Do you still remember what I told you when we met? Diedreg asked, making Issei nod. Very good, because I'm still thinking the same thing. Hype quote. Tiamat told me exactly the same thing. He thought Chestnut. But it's only natural for the dragons to be so distrustful of the biblical three factions after what they did. You are right, but it is also true that you are too trusting. Diedreg refuted, making the brunette nod internally. I know. After what I've experienced, I'll be more attentive to what Rias does, just in case. He finished, to then close his eyes calmly. Speaking of Tiamat. Issei couldn't help but open one of her eyes when she caught the rather amused tone of her tenant. Do you remember how those two women reacted when they saved you just in time before you had forced sex with the blue-haired reincarnated brat? Hype quote. Issei couldn't help but sweat at the memory. It had been a couple of days. Xenobia had locked him in the academy hall, saying various nonsense about wanting a strong son. She even pointed her sword against his neck so he wouldn't budge. If it hadn't been for Tiamat and Penemu, she would have lost her virginity right then in the worst possible way. Just remembering how Tiamat nearly killed her with one blow caused a great chill to run through her entire body. In fact, the dragon might have killed her, if Penemu hadn't stopped her with her words. Although, clearly the Kadri's icy eyes were much more scary than Tiamat's gaze, something that in itself should not be overcome under any circumstances. A deep chill ran through his body after remembering those looks, which quickly changed to one of full concern for him, asking him if Xenobia had done something to him. Perhaps they were much more overprotective than he initially thought. The good thing about that is that Xenobia has already completely abandoned the idea of raping Issei, even though that idea has been erased from her memory by the strong blow to the head she received from Tiamat. Yes, Xenobia wouldn't dare bother him again. Chapter 31 the true power of the vampire. Do you plan to take it here? Penemu asked with great intrigue, which was shown by her perfectly raised eyebrow. I think you are ready for the last test. He commented the chestnut, 
while he sat in the chair next to her. Being a two-person chair, they were a bit cramped. For some reason, whenever I come here, I feel like it's getting prettier, he added, giving the cadre's apartment a small compliment, then fixed her gaze on the woman, seeing that she was carrying the small statuette of the two of them and Tiamat in her hands. I always take it with me when I get a little nervous. She declared the cadre, seeing that the chestnut's gaze was fixed on the statuette. Skipping the fact that that was too cute, Issei couldn't help but be surprised. What's going on? She asked herself, raising an eyebrow. You never get nervous. She concluded herself, though that final verdict wasn't entirely true. It's something Azazel will tell you. He has more details. She explained the cadre, rising from her seat, leading him to the door. You have a lot of work to do today, just like me. A tiny smile appeared on her face, the kind that no one could see, except for those closest to the woman. I wish you luck. The brown-haired man only supported his hand on the cadre's shoulder as a farewell. Just when he was going to go downstairs, he was interrupted one last time. Before you go, I'd like you to tell him something. In fact, it's something that will help you too. She commented the cadre with complete seriousness from the doorway, something Issei picked up on instantly. Be careful what you wish for. Sometimes a person's deepest desires can turn into impulses that lead to terrible decisions. Issei couldn't help but lower his head quite empathetically. Quote dot dot dot. You mean that because of your past, right? She finally asked herself, receiving a nod from the cadre. You're just starting out in this world, but you have incredible potential. Make sure that potential doesn't end up being poisoned by dangerous desires, or you'll regret it for the rest of your lives. He finished, closing the door. A small silence arose after the farewell, while the brown-haired man looked at his hands. And how do I know that none of my wishes will take me to that side? She wondered, unable to find an answer. I was still very naive. At the occult club, did you finally come? Azazel commented arranging a couple of strange gadgets on a piece of furniture new to Issei's eyes. Will you help me accommodate them? He asked him, seeing that Issei quickly nodded and accompanied him. Be careful, they are the rarest sacred gears I've come across, and I still haven't fully figured them out. He warned him, handing her what looked like some kind of small square gold shield with a purple gem in the center. Issei just nodded again, while helping to arrange the sacred gears. Azazel could distinguish something strange in his attitude, because he was very thoughtful. Is there something bothering you? The boss asked, making Issei rub his hair with a small smile seeing that it was like an open book. Before coming here, I had a conversation with Penemu. The chestnut couldn't help but remember his words. She said, sometimes a person's deepest desires can turn into impulses that lead to terrible decisions. Issei couldn't slightly lower his gaze from her. I'm just wondering if I'm really doing things right. Things good, huh? Azazel asked, unable to help but smile at the boy's doubt. Tell me Issei, do you believe in good and evil? Issei couldn't help but feel confused at such a redundant question. Of course. She answered the chestnut. Okay. Azazel gave him another sacred gear, looking sideways at him. For you, have you always done good? Participating in someone's death is definitely not doing good. He answered the brunette quickly, and that was when Azazel could tell why he was hesitating so much. So, do the angels do evil according to your opinion? The fallen angel asked, causing Issei to look at him, indicating that the answer was obvious. Should I remind you of the number of people killed in the Great War? That last question caused a huge revelation to fall on Issei. Azazel widened his smile even more after seeing the reaction. The correct answer is that there is no right and wrong there is only right and wrong. And how will I know if I'm on the right track? Asked the chestnut. It's something very superficial. Issei, you are a kind idiot. At the answer, the brown-haired man couldn't help but roll his eyes. All the people who surrounded you, all those people, mainly Tiamat and Penemu, they taught you those values a long time ago. I understand that you are afraid of going astray, Azazel placed the last sacred gear that reached the chestnut tree, and then positioned a hand on his head. But there are many times when going astray is the best solution to the worst problems. He affirmed himself, giving her a toothy smile. Think of it like this, the cadre commented, thinking of an example. 
perhaps there will be times when you must defy your own master's rules to save a person who is very important to you, perhaps from death, or from an even worse fate. That is decided by circumstances. But, if you always do good to a person by defying a rule, or if you always do good to your people by the death of a few, isn't that right? He concluded, then took his hand off her head. I'm glad you have morality, that helps a lot in going on the right path. But, you must understand that morality in this world is so abstract and presumptuous that it becomes completely absurd. We are only worth for our people, we only live for our people, we only fight for our people, and only those people fight for us, only those people live for us, only those people are worth for us. In my way of seeing things, there are no manipulations, there are no tricks. Everyone I consider family is the people I will protect to the death, even if I have to start another war to do so, which is a bit of a contradiction. He concluded. Issei was completely stunned at her words. In fact, if there was any doubt within him about his past actions, they had completely disappeared. Probably, it was there that that small shred of his humanity finally left him completely as well. Why are you telling me all this? The chestnut asked, completely amazed at his words. I'm not going to lie to you. The cadre commented quickly. At first, I was only interested in you because of your sacred gear, I wanted to investigate it. But, for obvious reasons, I ended up investigating you as well. Azazel crouched down in front of him, and placed a hand on his shoulder. After watching your different performances, it has become very clear to me. You are a man who has respect. He nodded, squeezing the boy's shoulder, then got up and headed for the door. And respect is not just a word, it is much more than that. For you, what is respect? The brown-haired asked, watching as Azazel stopped and looked at him out of the corner of his eye. A smile if shot on the face of the cadre. When someone has respect, they never neglect the people they really care about protecting. Azazel looked back to the front. That's why I give you answers. The more you learn, the better chance you have to protect these people. Knowledge is everything, because you get to be big, to be strong, to be fast. That way you can survive longer. Azazel fixed his gaze on Issei, denoting a much more serious look than normal. And in your average lifetime, you better not waste the moment. The first time might be your last time. He concluded, resuming his walk. With all those teachings, you look like my father. Issei commented with a smile, which quickly faded. Well, you don't really look a bit like. She corrected herself, rubbing her hair. Whatever you say, dynamic. Brat. Azazel stopped just before closing the door, having remembered something very important. Hum, I almost missed the actual talk we were going to have here. He said to the air, causing the brunette to stare at him. Same, it's not that important. He continued, looking at the brunette with his typical carefree face. I just have to tell you that there is an all-faction gathering tomorrow. Before it starts, you will need to escort the god king of Asgard. He finished, closing the door. That, Issei yelled at the top of his lungs. You call that unimportant. The scream was clearly heard outside the old building, to which Azazel only managed to clean his right ear with his little finger, as if he hadn't heard anything. Now he could perfectly understand Penemu's concern. A few minutes later, it had taken a long time, but he was finally able to do it. Gasper left Kuo Academy on the condition that if he panicked in the slightest, he would go back inside the room where he had always been locked up. It should be noted that Issei accepted that condition practically instantly, since she knew the result perfectly. For that reason they had visited the familiar realm for two long weeks. If you don't open your eyes, it doesn't count. Issei exclaimed, giving him a big pat on the back to cheer him up. The vampire slowly opened his eyes, and the first thing he noticed is that the sunlight on earth is much stronger than that of hell. The first thing he distinguished in front of him were the open gates of the academy, followed by the typical sound of a busy city. Although it seems idiotic, this was something fascinating for the boy. It didn't take long for him to see how a couple of students passed from the outside of the bars, being immensely surprised when he simply didn't feel anything. That's right, he didn't feel anything. But, Gasper was speechless. He didn't understand how he could see all those smiling people walking by without even getting nervous. You were in the familiar realm for two weeks, an extremely hostile place at all times. It was normal to be vigilant under those circumstances. 
he commented the brunette, placing a hand on the vampire's shoulder. But, in a place where hostility is almost non-existent, why would you need to be vigilant, or nervous? There's simply no reason to be afraid of using your powers, if you're not going to use them in the first place. Issei gave him a huge chuckle. Do you know what I mean? She concluded, making Gasper look at him with a big twinkle in his eyes. And that's how they both went through various places in Kuo, just having fun. Zero stress, zero nerves. They were just free to have fun. They visited so many places that the brown-haired man couldn't help but thank Azazel for giving him so much money. Without him, the entire adaptation would most likely never have been finished. Although, the most important point was still missing. The hours passed quickly, and sunset began to dominate the sky. An incredible sight from the roof of Kuo Academy for someone who had been locked up for years. Gasper admired the view in silence, before looking closely at the brunette, who seemed to be watching Rias and the others leave the occult club. Another look was directed at the window where Penemu lived. The woman was in full view, doing her annoying paperwork for her. Gasper could tell that that gaze was parked for much longer, unlike the previous one. What do you see? The brown-haired question caught the vampire a bit off guard, who only deigned to look at the members of the occult club, without any answer. The brunette leaned his hand towards them, and closed it tightly into a fist. I can see it clearly. It's what drives me. He answered the chestnut, to then fix his gaze again. On Penemu. No one is perfect, but everyone has a purpose. Mine is to fight for what I believe in, what excites me, and what I love. Issei's eyes reflected the figure of Penemu, as she, that woman, fixed her hair with a small smile as she took a quick look at her statuette. It doesn't matter that it's the weakest Sekiryote. With a purpose like that, you're unstoppable. Issei finally took her hand down, though her serious face never disappeared. That's why I always train, that's why I always want to learn, that's why I always give my best. After all, always seeing a smile on the face of the people you appreciate the most, it's something that no one and nothing can match. Issei continued to look closely at Penemu, so he didn't notice Gasper's impressed look. That's something you still need to learn. And you better do it fast, before it's too late, she concluded, having a small memory of Irina. Issei got up, hinting that it was all over for today. Gasper got up quickly, unable to prevent Issei's words from eating away at his mind. Before Issei went down next to Gasper, the brown-haired man gave Penemu one last look, which seemed to have answered him mysteriously. They both went down the stairs, and once they did, that's where weird things started to happen. I want to do it again today. Gasper exclaimed with a big smile. I doubt we can tomorrow. The brunette answered, making Gasper look at him, confused. It is a very important day, in which you will probably also be present. Issei couldn't finish his sentence, as everything changed to a more sinister hue, at the same time the sky turned completely green. What is this? Gasper wondered aloud, clearly alarmed. It's a pocket dimension. She answered the brown quickly, getting close to the vampire. Someone dragged us here, and that can never be a good thing. He finished, displaying his armor. From the highest roof of the academy, a subject could be seen adjusting his hood. Although looking at her proportions, she was clearly a woman. Her face was shadowed, so you could barely see her lips. I can't believe I'm going to do this, the woman commented to herself. She had a voice quite recognized by all. The woman crossed her arms and stepped forward where there was nothing. Like that, she dropped down at an impressive speed, with only one goal. That goal to which their feet pointed when they fell on top of the head of a completely astonished Issei at the entrance, which resulted with his helmet breaking into a thousand pieces and with his face buried in the same crater caused by the blow. Before Gasper could even react, the hooded woman violently waved her arm and created a huge gust of wind, sending him flying, causing him to crash against the wall of the building. A rather tense silence dominated the environment, while the woman finally removed her feet from the chestnut's face and lifted him from his shirt as if it were a garbage bag. When she pulled her face out of the large crack, she could see how her face was a bloody mess. The hooded woman brought her face closer to the brown one, and proceeded to say in silence. The things I do for you. The hooded woman stopped looking at him when she felt someone pull her sleeve. The woman turned around, 
only to see Gasper, and how his eyes had activated his sacred gear, due to the large magic circle at his feet. My senpai, was Gasper's simple comment, with a tone that had been much harsher than normal, and his gaze matched that tone perfectly. The woman didn't even listen to his words, sending him away with a heavy blow to the face. Gasper rolled like a rugby ball until he finally slammed into the wall again, this time creating a few small cracks. I can't move, Issei thought in complete surprise, since he was using a lot of his power to move, but it was impossible for him. He wasn't just controlling time, there was something else there. I'm sorry, but I have to take your dear friend. She declared the woman, putting one of her hands in her pocket as she carried Issei over her shoulder as if she were a sack of potatoes. They pay a lot for such a rare sacred gear. He began to take slow steps to leave, until he heard faint words behind him. Tallo. Gasper stood up with great difficulty, while wiping the blood from his mouth. Did you say something? She asked with a rather mocking smile, causing Gasper to clench his fists tightly, at the same time that a couple of images of Issei's words and teachings flashed through his head. Let it go. She screamed at the top of her lungs, causing a reddish energy to appear in her body, at the same time that he took off in a burst of speed towards the woman's direction. In less than a second, he reached her and grabbed her face, burying her face deep into the pavement. The woman seemed surprised at such an act, or maybe not. In fact, she was surprised not by the outburst, but by the fact that the magic circle's pressure became much stronger, so she guessed that she had released the balance breaker from her. Gasper's sight eased when he saw that Issei had been released from the hold, though that look quickly turned to one of concern when he saw that he couldn't move because of his power. Even so, he couldn't care too much, as he received a strong roundhouse kick from the ground by the woman, now without her hood. Thanks to it, a large amount of quite recognizable light blue hair was released in various directions. Gasper got up with some difficulty, seeing how Tiamat was staring at him, with her typical stoic expression. The vampire boy only had to blink, for out of nowhere she appeared inches from him, giving him a strong blow to the face that made him spit out an absurd amount of blood. A great beating began to be presented by the dragon towards the vampire. The numerous sounds of boost were heard, at the same time that Issei ran towards him, shouting with great fury while delivering a strong blow to his back that generated a small shock wave. Tiamat simply looked back with her typical expression, implying that the attack hadn't even tickled her. The dragon released Gasper's face and dropped it like garbage to the ground, before turning around. The brat ended up being stronger than you expected. He told her, and then gave the chestnut a strong blow to the face that left him lying on the ground due to the enormous power. When Tiamat thought that everything was over, she felt an enormous pressure being present. Much stronger than the previous one, it might even be more than double what it was a few moments ago. Issei practically sank into the concrete because of this. The reddish magic circle grew even bigger and more intense, making Tiamat look away from him to see Gasper get up. Some kind of white and gray aura bubbled up around him like a huge wave, which eventually returned to its usual reddish color. His hair began to float from the immense magical energy that he emanated, and when he looked up, it could be seen that the color of his red eyes was even deeper, at the same time that one had the mark of a clock, and the other possessed a slit-like mark, giving it a kind of imaginary depth. I said drop it, he commented, with a face that could have scared anyone. The vampire widened his eyes greatly, causing another large magic circle to appear above Tiamat's head, generating an ashen gray light, only for a second later the entire ground to completely shatter due to the same gravity as the magic circle collided, against the floor. A huge crater had been generated, though Tiamat seemed unaffected by the enormous pressure and attempt on time control. Still, she couldn't help but be quite impressed. Gasper leaned his hand forward, causing a small magic circle to appear on his hand. Not a second later, Tiamat flew towards Gasper's hand after the strong gravity, where the vampire grabbed her hard by the face and slammed her against a wall, generating fairly slight cracks. Go fly, the vampire ordered, causing huge magic circles to appear in the sky and below Tiamat, where the building suddenly exploded from the gravity in the sky, and from the large number of rather powerful magic attacks that erupted from the ground. Between all the explosions and all the debris, Tiamat reached the sky because of the magic circle, only to see Gasper land in front of her. 
The dragon did not hesitate to give her a strong blow to the abdomen that made the vampire spit out a large amount of blood, but she seemed to refuse to give up. After all, her red eyes still glowed with great intensity. Gasper grabbed her by the neck and threw her towards the ground, at the same time numerous accompanying magic circles in the sky, casting various powerful magic attacks. When she finally hit the ground, already destroyed by the combat, everything turned black and white around her again, at the same time that two magic circles collided with each other, with her in the center, generating a kind of strange vortex that contracted everything. That it was close, only to then have the color return to normal and there was a huge bang that sent everything flying. Issei fell into the distance, getting up with a bit of difficulty, unable to help but be completely impressed by what he witnessed. He only looked up from him, to see that the Kuo Academy replica had been completely destroyed in mere seconds. Are you okay? The recognized voice made Issei turn around, only to see Gasper with all his hair standing on end. It was quite a funny sight, but it wasn't a moment in which he should be laughing. Before Issei could even reply, Tiamat appeared out of nowhere, grabbing the vampire by the back of his already tattered shirt, causing the boy to kick his feet free. The color changed completely back to gray and black, though neither was affected. I guess having the soul of the underdeveloped lizard helps you stay conscious under the rule of time. Tiamat commented in the most casual manner, causing Gasper to stop kicking after hearing Diedrag's nickname. Underdeveloped lizard, she thought to herself with wide eyes. Issei told me that only one person used that nickname often. Damn, I think you went a little too far. He commented the brunette, wiping the blood from his nose. You think. The tone of great concern in Tiamat made Gasper only more confused. Did I hurt you a lot? She asked herself, letting go of Gasper and quickly approaching him, assessing his injuries. Issei could only blush at the great concern of the dragon, and how she caressed every part of her face, in a desperate attempt to alleviate it. As always, you are too soft commented Penemu, appearing out of nowhere with two phoenix tears. Obviously, Gasper felt like his head was about to explode. He just didn't understand anything. How was the evaluation? The brunette asked, taking the phoenix tear, causing a rather relieved look to cross Tiamat's face. It's much more than I expected. Penemu commented, placing a hand on her chin. In addition to being able to use his balance breaker, he also has an evolution of it. Not to mention the fact that to use all that amount of power, he needs an absurdly high amount of magic. She concluded herself, giving the boy a look. In fact, I find it surprising that he can still stand. Is that what the mutated pieces do? The chestnut asked with great astonishment. I don't believe it, was Penemu's quick response. He must possess a high affinity with his sacred gear to be able to do such things. The only thing that the mutated piece does, is that a guy like him, who is much stronger than his master, can reincarnate and enter said person's peerage. I get it, Issei commented, nodding slightly. Even so, an evolution of her balance breaker. It's kind of surprising. Uh, huh. Gasper began to wave his hands in great exasperation, indicating that he was looking for an answer. Seeing this, Issei approached him with a smile. Sorry for testing you like this. He commented the chestnut, handing him the phoenix tear but it was the best way for you to experience the loss of someone close to you. I'm glad, because unlike me, you managed to respond in time. He concluded, outlining a toothy smile. This wouldn't have had any effect if I had told you before. Though his attacks weren't as forceful as they could have been. Tiamat commented, snapping his neck. It's not because of his lack of experience, but because he was still trying to contain himself. Although it didn't work out very well, he finished, emphasizing all the destruction caused. Maybe, but at least it's a start. She commented on the brunette with a small smile. The dragon cocked her head from side to side, indicating that she didn't quite agree with the answer. Issei. Who is? Gasper asked, referring to the dragon. Do you remember that in my stories I always mention Tiamat to you? He asked her, making Gasper's eyes widen. Well, she is Tiamat. The mean lady is your first master. Gasper exclaimed, completely impressed. A small tick appeared in Tiamat's eyebrow. Lady, she exclaimed. I may be over 20,000 years old, but I look 25. She concluded herself, clearly offended by the comment. Issei and Penemu laughed at the interaction. That does not matter. 
She answered the chestnut between laughs. Even if you look 30 or 40, it is impossible for you to stop being beautiful. Obviously, Tiamat couldn't hide the huge blush that shot up her cheeks. Meanwhile, in heaven, are you sure this will work out? Dulio asked, rubbing his hair. Don't worry. Michael relaxed it, arranging some papers. Having my sister as my squire, it won't be a problem. You know that's not what I mean. The seraph commented. There is no need to hold a meeting. The prophecy indicates that we all go the distance. There will be no more wars between us, at least, not until the trihexa dimensional prison breaks, or is close to breaking. What I remind you, still 2000 years to go. Remember what our father said. Michael looked at him seriously. Trying to take advantage of what the prophecy indicates could bring fluctuations, and in such a case, we could all die. It is best to act as we would have acted in the event that the prophecy had never been announced. That's right, I forgot that detail. Dulio rubbed his cheek with a nervous smile. But is there really a need to invite Asgard and the Yokai to the peace treaty? Of course. Michael answered without any hesitation, resting his chin on his hands. We're talking about the Sekiryote and the Hakuryuko. Right now, both the devils and the fallen angels have much more power than us. If we add more pressure from other sides, then it's more difficult for a war to break out, regardless of Azazel and Sirzex don't seem to be interested in one, after what happened in the last one. I can understand about Valley, he could destroy all of Asgard by himself, the strongest faction currently. Dulio commented, rubbing his chin. But I honestly don't understand the concern for Issei. He added with a rather confused tone. After all, he is the most deserving Sekiryote that ever lived. He's the weakest, until he's not, was Michael's simple answer, closing his eyes. It doesn't hurt to take precautions. Right now, we are the second worst faction as far as power is concerned, only the yokai are worse than us, and that's only because they almost went extinct in the battle against Trihexa. I understand. Dulio nodded, then raised an eyebrow. And what about the Olympics? You know very well that they have isolated themselves from everyone when humans abandoned those beliefs. She replied, closing her eyes calmly. They act like they are infatuated children. Dulio sneered. God created humans first. Therefore, they should always have had Christian beliefs. He concluded, receiving a nod from Michael. Without a doubt, this whole issue of the factions always turned out to be quite delicate. At least, the pressure of that very thing was noticeably reduced with the annihilation of some, and the near disappearance of others. In the Hyodo residence, thank you very much for today. He commented the chestnut, hugging Tiamat on the bed. I know it's not easy for you to hurt me so much. No problem. She cleared the dragoness, snuggling even closer into Issei. I thought it was a bit off when you asked me for that favor over two weeks ago, but I guess it was necessary. Issei just nodded. Tomorrow will be a hectic day, the brunette commented, holding the bridge of his nose. I have to go to Asgard. Don't worry, I'll be alert at all times. The dragon commented, turning quickly to mount on top of him. I'll go to the meeting. But, you're not invited, the brunette commented with slight astonishment. I do not care, Tiamat replied, resting her head on the chestnut chest. It's quite a dangerous place, and I'm not leaving you alone. Issei just smiled at her words and hugged her, something Tiamat gladly received. I always say that I'm going to protect you, but in the end you always end up protecting me, the brown-haired man commented with light grace. I also have that right, she declared the dragon, leaning back with even more comfort after feeling the warmth that Issei's hug gave her. She wished she could stay so close to him forever. How is the training of the Valkyries going? Odin asked. Watching out of the corner of his eye as Rossweiss sat down at the desk. I didn't have much time today to see them. He snapped. Things are going well for now, Lord Odin. He answered the Valkyrie quickly. The exercises, training, and friendly battles are bringing a great result as usual. Odin looked at her for a short second after her answer, to then look at his papers again. The strength of the Valkyries has increased a bit of late. She declared with satisfaction. It's quite necessary since they are the only thing left of the Asgardian army, besides an old god and his two foolish sons. She concluded, unable to help but frown. But we are the most powerful faction, Rossweiss commented, not understanding her referent leader's concern. That's the amazing thing, girl. 
Odin replied, causing Rossweiss to pout a little at her nickname. Stop calling me that, she exclaimed with quite annoyance. You're still a girl, Odin sneered. Going back to the main topic, the fact that we are currently the most powerful faction indicates how badly the supernatural world was left after the battle against Trihexa. The god couldn't help but squeeze the pen tightly after the memory of the many lives lost in the enormous destruction. If it hadn't been for the other two dragon gods, God, and the Demon King, no one would remember what happened. After all, there would be no one to remember. I was informed that the gathering was chosen near the Trihexa jail. The Valkyrie commented, denoting concern. Don't you think that's a bit risky? No one is stupid enough to break the seals on a beast that would simply destroy everyone and everything, affirmed the god. That place was chosen strategically, since that was the only time we all came together with one goal. It's a reminiscence, saying, if we did it before, why not now? Odin raised both eyebrows to emphasize his words. Going back to the main topic, it's pretty good to see that you're managing to handle an even better job than your grandmother. He congratulated the god with a small smile. You'd better get used to leading them, because that's your future, which is actually pretty close already. He concluded, looking back at his papers. Odin covered up the fact that Rossweiss lowered her gaze rather sadly. It's not that she didn't feel great honor in being that. The great sadness of the Valkyrie was due to another factor, and was strictly linked to it. What about my brother? Rossweiss deflected the subject with the clear intention of not thinking about it. Roswell is taking her with a small group. She quickly answered God. They're not as strong as him, but I think they could be of great help. Even your brother could become my right-hand man once you reach your physical 25th birthday. There he was with the subject again. She tried to dodge it, but it always came back to her. Odin couldn't help but put a hand to his chin as he thought further about Ross's brother. In fact, I think he might assign a close watch on my son Loki, who's been making some strange moves lately. Hearing the topic, Rossweiss couldn't help but blink her eyes in great intrigue. Did something happen with Loki? Omitting the fact that he's seen Ophis a few days ago, Loki is very relaxed. Odin seriously looked at him. And you know very well that he never stops complaining about his brother Thor, or about my reign. Do you think that's a bad sign? Ross asked with a serious look. Unlike Thor, Loki has always been someone who's fascinated with knowledge. Hell, he's basically just one big mass of it. The god commented, making the Valkyrie sweat at the sarcastic comment. I'm just thinking that he must have discovered something that he didn't like one bit. She concluded herself, narrowing her eyes. The meeting, the Valkyrie asked, raising an eyebrow. There are a lot of factions he doesn't like, but I doubt he would do anything at the time. Odin thought aloud carefully, it's probably something else, and knowing that he didn't learn past lessons very well from him, I'm sure it won't mean anything good. The talk could not continue any longer, because someone knocked on the door. Enters. Odin yelled, watching as Issei entered the room, bowing to the two people inside. I suppose you must be Lord Odin. The chestnut commented with slight nervousness. It's an honor to meet you. The Sekariote. Ross thought his eyes widening slightly. No need to be so formal, boy. He declared the god with total informality, something that undoubtedly caught the chestnut's attention. Chapter 32. Destined. Part 1. You already know that Valley is the yokai's escort. Odin asked, looking at the now seated Issei. Yes, old man. He answered the brunette, causing a comic drop to roll through Ross's head at his nickname, while Odin seemed to begin to regret telling him that there was no need to be so formal. Azazel informed me of everything before coming here. Issei couldn't help but look at the god's monocle with great intrigue, since he was completely opaque. I mean, why was he wearing one of those, if it wouldn't even let him look through, and vice versa? I see, Odin replied, resting a hand on his chin. Do you know the reason? Issei looked down, thinking carefully. They didn't tell me anything about it. But considering that this meeting was specifically set up by the two of us, it makes me think that escorting two other factions with me and Valley, is like saying, we share our power with you, so they see that we really want the peace. He declared the chestnut, trying to explain himself in the best possible way. Amazing. Ross exclaimed, genuinely impressed. I was told that you entered the supernatural world only a few months ago, 
but you already seem to understand things quite well. The woman said with a small smile. Well, I guess it's a matter of logic, the brunette commented, rubbing his hair at the compliment. Although, I must also say that I had an instructor who helped me on those specific topics. Odin couldn't help but look between the two with a tiny smile. She is Rossweiss. She is currently a Valkyrie in my right hand. A rather mocking smile appeared on the god's face. By the way, she's one of the most dishonorable Valkyries, because she's the first to take so long to get a husband. That last one didn't need to be said. Ross got up from his seat, comic little tears threatening to trickle down his cheeks. Is seriously, the chestnut wondered internally. He was quite impressed, since from his point of view, the Valkyrie wasn't too bad. Finally, those comical tears in her bright face ended up changing into something completely depressive, something that alerted the brunette. She sat up, looking down at her as she trembled slightly, and said the following words. Besides, you know that's not my fault. Odin couldn't help but look at her with some empathy at her last words. But not enough to stop bothering her forever. At least not until she has a husband. But for now, he would decide to give poor Valkyrie a break. I think it's about time. Odin got up from his seat, causing Ross's completely depressed look to calm down a bit, while the brown-haired man couldn't help but look between the two with a raised eyebrow. Understood, he exclaimed the brunette, getting up from the seat. Those were pretty private things anyway, and it would be best not to disturb. Meanwhile, in a completely isolated place, only the sky and the blood-red color of the sand were the clues to know that the place was hell. In the distance, it could be seen how a kind of dimensional gap seemed to be perfectly controlled, although it was surprising how huge it was. Only a few distortions could be seen around the enormous thin line that led to another dimension, while three great seals were in charge of keeping that door closed. The scarcity of large tremors and distortions further reinforced the fact that this dimensional prison was under complete control. For now, around him, there was nothing but huge craters and mountains of sand, added to the same sand. It seemed to have been a theater of war a thousand years ago, and the result of erosion and destruction had left the land completely barren. In all that completely desolate place, you could see an enormous construction, and inside there, is where the most important men of the supernatural world were. Valley leaned against a wall while looking at everyone present. He didn't seem to be very interested in this whole meeting, but he had no choice. He was present on Azazel's orders. Still, the albino found the sight interesting, as Tiamat stood across the room in exactly the same posture as him, apparently awaiting her destined rival. It was somewhat curious, since he had understood that she had not been invited. But the truth is, who would dare tell him to go away? The faction leaders looked at each other as sweat broke out on their faces. They all had smiles on their faces, but it was obvious that the situation was a bit tense. Especially, since one of the leaders hadn't arrived. Yet, Penemu positioned herself next to Tiamat, and they began to chat in a low voice, while they observed those present. There was Rias and much of his servitude, Gabriel and Ajuka Beelzebub. There wasn't Gaspar or Kaneko in the meeting room, but it wasn't something that bothered him either. How strange that you don't bring any squires, Yasaka. Azazel broke the silence, directing his gaze at the yokai woman. You know very well that our species no longer has any especially strong warriors, so it would be crazy to bring someone here. The blonde woman commented with a small smile. But, it's not necessary either. After all, if things get out of control, everyone knows what the outcome will be, she concluded, giving Tiamat a small look. Obviously, everyone took the hint. Simply, if someone tried something, probably no one would get out alive, except her. And perhaps, also the Kadri, who seemed to get along quite well with the Dragon Queen. Everyone was distracted from their thoughts when a small snow white magic circle appeared in the small room, seeing that Odin finally made an appearance, along with his other two companions. You're late, Sirzex commented, resting his hand against his chin. Sorry, we got lost on the road of life. The god commented without giving much importance to the demon king's comment, taking a seat. Issei couldn't help fixing his gaze on Valley for a short second, who returned it with a half-smile. Though clearly, she didn't seem to be very friendly. What are low and high-class devils doing in this place? Odin asked unable to help but raise an eyebrow, fixing his gaze on Rias, Asia, Xenobia, Kiba and Akino. 
As you know, Issei belongs to my sister's servants. Sirzex answered quickly. They have the right to be here. He finished, then gave Michael a look. But let's not divert the subject. After all, you haven't exactly told us the reason for this meeting. That is, omitting the fact of the clear intention to sign the peace, you know. Sirzex looked at Odin and Yasaka, with the intention to make his words even clearer. You must know perfectly well why. Gabriel tried to speak, but Michael stopped her with her hand. She had forgotten that only the leaders could speak, unless it was necessary to interrupt. Excuse me my sister. The seraph commented with a smile, causing Sirzex to wave his hand, indicating that he was not bothered by him. But, she has a point about that. Everyone knows that we called this meeting with two foreign factions to add extra pressure to the treaty. After all, you have two incredibly large forces on your side. So, if only we requested that meeting, you could have ignored it without problem. The sky leader explained, because in the event that we give them some trouble, they could quickly take care of us. The only thing that ensures the intervention of two foreign factions, is the fact that both devils and fallen angels do not do as they please with their might, because everyone is watching them. Therefore, at this, Sirzex and Azazel couldn't help but laugh fiercely, something that took those on the sidelines by surprise, except for Tiamat, who really wasn't giving much thought to the topic. Have you already forgotten that we overthrew the followers of the previous demon king, because we didn't seek war? The demon asked gracefully. There was no need to go to such an extreme. We would have accepted one way or another. What the Siskin says. Azazel declared, leaning back in his seat. Mostly, wars are the product of people's greed and worldly desires, it can even be a desire as simple as the need to destroy everything. They may try to hide the reason through their faith, or whatever, but the truth will always be the same. Search for wealth, power and authority. Well, almost always. The cadre commented at the end, raising both his hands. Angels are known to fight for their faith. But, it's just a pretty big exception to the issue. He concluded, leaning back further in the chair. I know that you both agree to eliminate every tension or conflict. You have shown it before, and that is why I know that you will sign the treaty, along with our kind guests. Michael declared with a huge grin. Yasaka couldn't help but look at Michael with a smile. This man is so much more than just a pretty face, she thought, watching him drive the devils and fallen angels to his limit. For me there is no problem. Azazel commented quickly, settling back into his seat. The only thing that interests me is my research on the sacred gears, and having a good time from time to time. I don't feel like wasting my time with another stupid war. He concluded, cleaning his ear with his little finger at his last words. He really didn't care at all to be here right now. It would be quite stupid to have the intention of starting another war, knowing the results of the last one. Sirzex joined soon after, giving his point of view. I don't want to lose any more of my people, and I know this is the best way to accomplish that goal. He concluded, outlining a big smile. I agree. Odin quickly joined in, giving Yasaka a quick look. And I'm sure the lady thinks the same way. The woman nodded, giving him a small smile. Issei couldn't help but smile at the thought that it was all figured out. Very good, we already have all the approvals from the leaders. Michael declared with his typical smile. Now, all that remains is to hear the response from the Diedrag and Albion wielders. Hearing this, the brown-haired and the albino couldn't help but look at him with a raised eyebrow. After all, it was because of you that this meeting came about. He concluded, causing both of them to look at each other for a short period of time. For some reason, Issei felt that Valley wouldn't agree to the condition. After all, that prevented her from having a confrontation with him. And in a way, he also wanted to have a battle against the albino. Valley, Azazel sent a look at the albino, who closed his eyes with a smile. As long as that doesn't stop me from fighting strong people, I don't see a problem with it. For some reason, Valley's words had made Issei clench his fists tightly. Valley considered him worthless. Issei. The brown-haired man snapped out of his thoughts after hearing Michael's question, causing everyone to look at him expectantly. Issei fixed his gaze on Valley with great seriousness, who only gave him a smile like the one from that time. He wasn't arrogant or anything like that. Rather, she seemed to be challenging him. But, Issei was not a person who only thought about fighting and his pride. 
when he glanced at Tiamat and Penemu, was the answer. After all, if he could avoid a battle that hurt his comrades and best friends, he was always going to take that path. Even if it got to the point of being somewhat dishonorable. I agree. She answered the brown-haired one, to later look at Valley, who only deigned to close her eyes, without giving much importance to the answer. Brilliant. Gabriel clapped his hands with joy. That means we are already one step away from forming the alliance for the... Valley's eyes widened, and from one second to the next, the albino was covering the woman's mouth so she wouldn't continue speaking. Everyone was impressed by his action, although much more by his enormous speed. Gabriel looked at him with a mixture of confusion and surprise, to which the albino responded with a quick tilt of his head towards Rias and her entourage, as well as Beelzebub and Rossweiss. At that moment, she understood that she almost did something very stupid. Those who did not understand the albino's action completely ignored it. Well, only Rossweiss did, since everyone else pretended not to know anything about the prophecy. I'm sorry. Gabriel commented with a big embarrassed blush on his face. Don't worry, she answered the albino, resting again in the corner of the wall. We all slip up from time to time. He soothed her. Michael cleared his throat, making everyone look at him. Besides, we still lack a person's approval. Now yes, everyone was intrigued by his comment, with the exception of Valley, who already knew more or less where the shots were going. Considering that Tiamat is with Issei, she also belongs to the demon faction. Hearing that, Tiamat glared at him, and they all broke into a sweat as they realized that Michael had said something he shouldn't. Just because he's with Issei, doesn't mean he's part of the devils. She answered the dragon queen with an icy look on her face, which only intensified when she spat out that last word with great venom. Sorry for the misunderstanding, Michael replied quickly with a rather shaky smile on his face. Yes, of course you're sorry, the dragon commented in a whisper that everyone could hear. I don't care what they do. As long as they don't bother me, Penemu, or Issei, I won't have any reason to rip their skin off inch by inch. Those last words made everyone tense up at the thought of that scene. Being emotionally attached to other people, and becoming better friends with her greatest enemy, everyone thought that Tiamat had changed, even a little. It was more than obvious that they were all flatly wrong. He still had that aura of death that felt miles away, plus the enormous resentment and repulsive disgust towards the biblical three factions, which only seemed to increase further over the past millennium, rather than diminish. Well then, Odin spoke, breaking the tension that had built up. Since we all agree, I guess we're done. All the leaders nodded in agreement. In that case, I'd like to thank you for your time, and, Michael couldn't speak any further as a resounding tremor that lasted only a second struck the entire room. Everyone looked at each other with wide eyes, except for Issei and Valley who had the closest window, and stuck their faces out of the window to see if anything had happened. As soon as they did, his eyes widened a lot as he saw how a part of the lower area of the building was emanating a large amount of smoke, while huge golden magic circles appeared everywhere. Another tremor occurred but much stronger and more forceful, which ended with the explosion of the roof where they were gathered. A huge curtain of dust appeared in the place, where it could be seen that everyone was fine. Is everyone all right? Ross asked, his eyes widening as he saw that Rias and his servants had completely frozen. This atmosphere, he thought, seeing that the whole place looked more gray. I can't teleport back to the city. The Elzebub declared with great surprise. That's why. Valley pointed to the sky, and when the dust cleared, everyone could see how they were completely surrounded by magic circles that prevented movement. Lord Odin, the Valkyrie exclaimed, rushing to his side to protect him. Yes, there is someone who is controlling the time, the god commented with great seriousness. Luckily, we are strong enough to be affected. Those magic circles, Azazel thought aloud with much surprise. Yes, they are made with the power of infinity. Sirzex commented, frowning. I doubt it's Ophis, since they're still very weak, plus there's no reason for her to fight with us. In short, someone borrowed a bit of his power, Michael completed the Demon King's sentence. Luckily, it's just a tiny bit of their power. I can break them if Odin helps me do it. Yasaka explained, receiving a quick nod from the god. Aren't you going to do anything? Sirzex asked completely incredulous, seeing how Tiamat remained leaning against the wall as if nothing had happened. Of course not. 
Her lips twisted into a rather macabre smile. I already told you I wasn't part of your filthy species, idiot. She answered. Unless Issei or Penemu is in danger, I won't intervene in the slightest. Hearing her explanation, Sirzex felt stupid for thinking that he could manipulate her just like Issei. We can do it ourselves. We just need your support. The god commented with great seriousness, beginning to create a magic circle, along with Yasaka. They all surrounded Yasaka and Odin creating different barriers to protect them from any enemy attack. It didn't take long for these enemies to appear, where almost all of them were humans in disguise, except for some that seemed to be demons. The first, if it was expected, but the second. Demons. Azazel asked in complete surprise. They are the remnants left over from the previous dynasty. Sirzex quickly explained, acknowledging a few. They are nothing. The problem, is if someone prominent from the pillars arrives, or worse, the predecessor of the demon king. If they're here, assume that one of them will show up. Odin answered quickly, looking at the large number of enemies out of the corner of his eye. Issei. Valley. Penemu called from inside the barrier, causing them both to look up. You take care of the enemies. We'll take care of this. Right after saying that, numerous magical attacks from all directions began to hit the barrier. Valley and Issei quickly nodded, where they both went to their balance breaker instantly. They're probably attacking your other friends. Valley commented, while she was in charge of beating up a few, along with the chestnut. I know, Issei replied, unable to help but smile inside his helmet. But, I'm sure Gasper will be able to handle them. He concluded, breaking away from Valley as a large combined magic attack headed their way. Meanwhile, with Gasper and Kaneko, it was much easier than we expected, commented one of the many women who was in the room. They were all hooded and wore some kind of metal mask, probably to hide their identities. It was only like this thanks to our leader devising a tool so that time control would not affect us. He added another of the many women as he emphasized some sort of necklace, and smirked at the boy and girl hanging on the wall. That's what you get for believing that species like you are superior to humans. Meanwhile, Gasper kept his eyes lowered, sweating slightly. Beside her, Kaneko was completely rigid, probably due to the fact that she had been affected by time control as well. Gasper gave a small silent sigh, causing one of the closest women to look at him with slight curiosity. That same woman lowered her gaze, observing a red magic circle that covered the entire room. Now that I think about it, he had never mentioned to us that he used his powers through a magic circle, she thought, beginning to doubt. Unfortunately for her, the doubt came quite late, as the magic circle flashed with great force, causing the women to crash to the ground, their bones cracking like glass from the enormous pressure on their bodies. Obviously, the screams weren't long in coming, but as fast as they came, just as fast they disappeared, as they were all unconscious from the immense pain. Gasper quickly cut off the continuity of his power, causing everything around him to return to normal. Kaneko, wake up, the vampire yelled, to which the little girl blinked heavily. She couldn't seem to, wake up from all the damage from her. Besides, her arms seemed to have been broken from Gasper's earlier attack. Damn, I can't use more power, or I might hurt her more than necessary, he thought, opting for a very concerned look. The vampire just looked outside thanks to the smashed wall watching as Rias and the others started to move inside the huge barrier, at the same time that Azazel had started to fight with a strange brunette woman. Although, the strangest thing was to see how she had a golden armor. I must say I'm impressed, Tiamat said to herself, sitting on one of the many pieces of rubble in the room. I never thought that Azazel would save a fragment of Fafnir's soul to turn into a sacred gear. Tiamat's pretty brows knitted together. Though, I don't know whether to just be impressed, or angry too. She concluded, at the same time that she extended her fist to the side of her when someone tried to attack her from behind her, causing her head to explode into a thousand pieces. The Great War ended a thousand years ago. The brunette exclaimed, fighting alongside Valley. Does that mean that Azazel kept that fragment all this time? He finished, bumping back into Valley. You should know by now, he's crazy. He exclaimed the albino to then continue the attack with Issei. But that doesn't make him much stronger. He added. Besides being an artificial sacred gear, a small fragment of the weakest dragon king doesn't make much of a difference. 
After taking out many enemies, he turned around to take a quick look at the chestnut. But that doesn't mean he's not stronger than Sirzex now. And obviously, that means he'll humiliate Kateria. He concluded, disappearing in a blur that left Issei impressed. Had he been using only a fraction of his maximum speed during the entire match? Seeing that they were being decimated very easily, and that Kateria was having a lot of trouble with Azazel, all the enemies started to scatter in fear, making the battle much easier. When Issei finished cleaning his entire area, he couldn't help but smile when he saw that Gaspar was fine, besides that Rias and the others had entered the fight to support. And finally, his gaze settled on Azazel, and how the madman had cut off his own arm to kill his opponent. It seems that there are still many details to improve, huh? The Kadri wondered with a smile, as he took the purple sphere that symbolized the sacred gear, and then kissed it. You will have to put up with me a while longer, Fafner. Did he sacrifice his arm? The chestnut wondered with a nervous drop of sweat. What the hell is wrong with him? Their internal chatter didn't last much longer, as Azazel was thrown to the ground by a strong silver light, causing everyone to stare in great surprise. But what? The brown wondered with wide eyes. Azazel sat down in the small crater that his own body had created, and then placed his hand on his cheek. You seem to be mistaking your target, right, Valley? She asked herself, looking up. I'm sorry, Azazel, the albino commented. This side seems much more fun to me. Whatever you want. She answered the cadre as if nothing had happened, getting up while dusting herself off. I only want you to answer two questions, Valley. He concluded without his typical smile erasing from his face. Hmm. The albino crossed his arms, denoting his interest. Azazel spread his wings, reaching Valley's height. The first question, is that Penemu has been investigating different rumors of a group that was gathering all the people that could be a danger to all the factions. Azazel broke into a big smile. I think it was called the Chaos Brigade, or something like that. Azazel raised both of his arms high, to emphasize the magic circles that did not allow him to run away, and it just so happens that the supposed leader of that organization is the same woman who was capable of creating these magic circles, Ouroboros Ophis. Are you implying that I am part of that group? Valley asked, still crossing his arms. At this moment, Azazel's gaze became extremely serious. Here goes the second question. When she was fighting Kateria, she told me that you were a traitor for collaborating with the usurpers, since you are the rightful heir to the title of Demon King. Hearing this, everyone was completely shocked, unable to believe what they had heard. At Azazel's words, Valley began to laugh slowly, before letting out a huge laugh. To begin with, I am part of the Chaos Brigade. But, it has nothing to do with the factions. Everyone does what they see fit. Since Ophis has no interest in our movements, as long as at some point let's help you get your home back. Valley held up a second finger. As you know, interests are varied, so there are different groups within the organization. For the most part, the groups are made up of people who are hungry for power and supremacy. Valley held up a third finger. And finally, if they were shocked by what they heard, they were even more shocked now, as a few dozen bat wings appeared on Valley's back at the same time as an immense power completely surrounded him, forcing Azazel to step back where he was. Everyone else. I am Valley Lucifer, the son of the previous demon king. He exclaimed. Unfortunately, no one could be more impressed than they were at this point. Ah except for Tiamat, who seemed to be quite curious about this. Wait, if he's the son of the demon king, the dragon thought aloud. You realized? Penemu asked, moving closer to her. Since Valley is only 18 years old, and the physical appearance of supernatural beings slows down after 21, it means that the Demon King did not die during the fight against Trihexa. There are only three seals. The dragon commented, remembering that dimensional prison. No matter what happened before, the important thing now is to know, Penemu couldn't finish speaking, as Sirzex undid the barrier and took several steps forward. Where is the Demon King? Sirzex demanded to know making Valley remove his helmet to show her smile. I killed him, he declared, as if he was the most normal thing in the world, causing everyone to look at him in great surprise. Because you did, Beelzebub asked, making Valley's smile immediately disappear. That is not of you incumbents. The albino glared at him. Beelzebub couldn't help but take an awkward step back behind the dark look. 
I'll just say that I completely don't care about the rain, so there's no need to be bothered about it. He concluded. Finally, Valley descended a few meters from Issei, who, to his surprise, the brunette didn't seem to be as impressed as the others. Did you seriously think that I could join a treaty, since that would prevent me from fighting with you? What impresses me is that you didn't want to avoid that. She asked herself in a rather mocking manner. Are you afraid of me? The chestnut dematerialized his helmet and stared at it. No. It was Issei's immediate response, something that surprised the albino, since he raised an eyebrow in response. You do not have it. She asked again, raising both her hands as well as her dragon and demon wings. I am the heir to the rightful demon king, a half-blood because of my human mother. Thanks to that, I was able to become the bearer of Albion. A large amount of slightly bluish silver energy shot out in various directions, causing everyone's hair to wave violently from the bursts of power. I don't want to sound conceited, but I am the meaning of the word, miracle. Being a half-blood, I obtained impressive power. By fate. Finally, the demon wings disappeared, causing him to cross his arms. Now do you understand, I am the most powerful Hakuryuko of the past, the present, and probably the future. Valley pointed at it. Instead, you are known as the weakest Sekiryote ever. There is simply no point of comparison between us. A somewhat uncomfortable silence appeared between them. All the others also seemed expectant to the chestnut's response. Against all odds, Valley could see how a smile appeared on Issei's face. That only makes it more interesting to me. She answered, causing the albino to widen her eyes greatly. And I'll just tell you one thing. She continued, materializing his helmet and striking a battle pose. You better not underestimate me. He exclaimed, causing Tiamat and Penemu to send a rather unique shudder through his entire body. Finally, Valley was able to react. Usually, he would laugh out loud whenever someone surprised him immensely. But, without a doubt, his level of surprise had never been higher. Therefore, he only materialized his helmet and said a few last words. Let's see how much your words are worth. Thanks for watching like share and subscribe for the next parts one got in my storage.